Lights, cameras, action. Okay, this is the uh, Board of Education, Facilities, and Finance Committee's uh, uh, meeting for dated November 6, 2014. Um, on the agenda, first we have a little general business to take care of. Verification the meeting was properly posted. Yes, the meeting was properly posted. Thank you, Ms. Dudley. Um, we also have the opportunities for citizens to speak. Do we have any citizens speaking tonight? Do we have any correspondence from citizens? No. Okay. I don't see anyone speaking either. So we'll move on to the committee issues. Action items. The first action item is approval of monthly vouchers. Any questions brought in? No questions at this time. Mr. Como, didn't you have any questions for the monthly vouchers? I didn't. Yeah. I usually do. Yeah. I broke my streak. I bet you Steve has at least one. No, I didn't have this one. Okay. Well, do I have a motion? I move approval. <coughs> Mr. McCaffrey motions for approval of the monthly vouchers. Mr. Edlin seconds the motion, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? One opposed. Okay. Motion passes 5-0. Now we have information items. That was, we only had one action item tonight. Information items, first of all, is a presentation of the 2013-14 financial statements by Schenck SC. And I believe we have an important guest here tonight to help us with this presentation. We do. Yeah, would you introduce our important guest, Ms. Thank you. Clifton? David Mako is the, pre uh, is the uh, partner in charge of our audit uh, and the one responsible for signing the dotted line that we are compliant. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lord. Okay, have uh, at us and be, be gentle, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we got two documents I'm going to go through. Uh, one is the annual financial report. Uh, that is the representation and complete financial statements of the uh, school di district uh, as of and for the year ended June 30th, uh, 2014. And I'll go through a couple of the, the uh, reports, but certainly if anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt me and we can answer the questions uh, as we go through the audit report. Uh, starting on pages one, two, and three is a very important report. Uh, it is called the Independent Auditors Report, and that's really where we report to the Board of Education. Uh, it is broken down into identifying the statements of the financial statements uh, that are contained within, within this document. Excuse me, it talks about <coughs> management is responsible for the financial statements. So when we prepare the audit, uh, we prepare the financial statements directly from the financial records of the district. Uh, management is responsible for maintaining those records. Uh, our re responsibility is really to an expressive opinion on the financial statements you have in front of you, meaning uh, we do uh, sample tests on various different transactions, disclosures, and amounts contained within your financial statements. Uh, and therefore, uh, our whole uh, role is to express an opinion on those financial statements uh, and to make sure that they're fairly presented in all material respects. So if you turn over to page two, uh, page two is our independent auditor's report, uh, and it, the opinion is on page two. Uh, and the opinion does state that uh, the financial statements uh, referred to above present fairly in all material respects. So. Uh, your financial statements were fairly presented. Uh, we believe the financial statements you have in front of you contained all the appropriate disclosures and amounts that uh, uh, rec recognize the transactions that happened throughout the year and as of uh, June 30th, 2014. Uh, there's other additional information uh, talking about other matters. Uh, there's some uh, budget to actual comparisons on your uh, general and special revenue funds, also some disclosures related to your other post-employment benefits and your uh, management discussion analysis. Those are required supplemental information that GASB does require uh, or, or recommend to be included in your financial statements. Uh, the other information is really some combining financial statements and your single audit report. Uh, because you receive federal and state financial assistance, uh, near the back of the document is a federal and state financial assistance audit, or single audit as it's called. Uh, we have uh, reviewed and approved uh, and, and tested the compliance with applicable laws and regulations, and we're pleased to represent that there were no uh, non-compliance that is required to be resolved. So uh, in our opinion, the financial statements and the grants uh, managed by the district are being managed properly. 
any questions on that? Then starting on page 4 uh, through uh, page 16, uh, it is what is known as management's discussion and analysis. As I indicated, that is required supplemental. It is uh, designed to complement the financial report that you have in front of you. Uh, it is prepared uh, by the district management. It is, goes through, uh, from in more of a narrative uh, transaction, what happened in 2014, uh, how that compares to the prior year. Uh, in, in addition, there is certain dis, uh, charts and additional information to assist you uh, in analyzing what happened in 2014 compared to 2013. So I would encourage the board to review that. Then if we turn to page 17, here we get into your government-wide financial statements. And your government-wide financial statements are designed uh, to really recognize the district as if you were a business-type operation, meaning all your assets, your capital, including your capital assets, the lands, the buildings, uh, the various different assets used to provide services to uh, students of the district and residents of the uh, Waukesha School District uh, are recorded, and it shows that the total assets that you're managing on a historical cost basis uh, is a little over $121 million. Now, the majority of those assets, once again, are really within the infrastructure, the buildings, and the uh, land and the equipment that is used to provide services. Um, but it does give you a frame of reference of the magnitude of the assets that you have been entrusted and are managing on behalf of uh, the taxpayers of the uh, school district. Uh, liabilities include amounts owed to others. Uh, in addition, liabilities include general obligation debt. Uh, liabilities also include uh, the recognized portion of your other post-employment benefit. So those liabilities uh, are currently about uh, 72.3 million. And then your net position or your net ownership uh, shows that uh, net position is about 49 million. Uh, it is broken down into various different categories to show the assets uh, in net position. Uh, the largest is which is your uh, net investment and capital assets. Uh, it means that of the assets that are out in the, in the district, uh, you have paid for and financed uh, uh, about 60 million of those assets. Uh, the, there, it is also broken down into a number of categories that are restricted. Uh, you'll notice a new category because the district was self-funded. Uh, there is a restriction based on guidance by uh, the uh, DPI on segregating some of the, uh, the surplus in your uh, current year claims or, or, or claim savings that you had in the current year. Uh, that is really restricted for future claims. That's about 4.4 million. And you can see uh, the other uh, restrictions, uh, including a food service program uh, that is really your fund 50 for food service. That's about 1.6. Uh, the unrestricted, you can see, is in a deficit. That is primarily because of the other post-employment benefit liability that is recognized in this statement in the intent that you're going to finance those in the, into the future with uh, future uh, revenue sources of the district. Any questions on that? Then if we turn to page 18, uh, page 18. Sir, sir. Excuse me, Dave, and this is really more for Lori going back to previous years. This used to be a larger deficit amount by a substantial amount due to our, our OPEB liabilities that have come down significantly. I believe when we first started to keep track of our OPEB liability, we were at 195 million. Uh, now, I think we're at about 58 million for that, roughly. It's disclosed in here, but that's... Is it roughly 58 million? It seems there? So you're within a couple million. Okay, yeah. so over the last several years, we've been able to mitigate that through some of the changes we've made um, so on and so forth. So that number used to be a lot larger. Well, part of what helped also is, if you recall, in 2011, we had a huge number of retirees. Yep. They came off. There were a number of factors that have changed over the last few years that have gone into that. But that's down substantially from before. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. Good. We turn to page 18, uh, where page 17 was a snapshot as of June 30th. Uh, page 18 says, how did we get from last year's ending net position balance to this year? So it reflects a period of time uh, and is really broken down into the various different functions and programs. As you see, 
Uh, and, and then you can notice there are things called general revenues. Those are really revenues that aren't allocable to any type of function, uh, meaning your property taxes, uh, your general aids. Uh, those are really uh, funding of the overall district. Uh, so you can see your general revenues totaled about 120, 129, almost 130 million. Uh, you will notice that change in net position. You did have a growth in your net position of about 13 million. So part of what when you saw that better uh, unrestricted balance, part of it is that growth in uh, in your net asset position as a total. So that is part of it too. Uh, now, as you break that down, uh, you'll, we'll see in a little bit, you did have a, a positive year in your governmental funds. Uh, we talked a little bit about that 4.4 million in health insurance cost savings. Uh, that really is part of that, uh, you know, part of your, your net position. Uh, there's also, uh, when you look at what happened between the two years, you reinvested in some of your capital equipment. So you invested more in your capital equipment than uh, the depreciation and the borrowing for capital, capital leases. Uh, that was about 1.4 million of that increase. And also you paid down long-term debt uh, of about 2.7. So those all factor into the increase. So as you pay down your long-term obligations, you grow what you own uh, is really the uh, how that works. So. All total, you had about a, a growth in your net position of about 13 million this year. Okay. Then, if we turn, uh, starting on page 19, uh, page 19 starts looking at how you adopt your annual budget. So, mm -hmm. uh, the first two, first two statements are really on a, a theoretical basis, on a full accrual basis. Uh, page 19 starts with uh, what is your annual budget and how you adopt your annual budget, and it is broken down into general fund. Uh, in other funds. Now there is combining uh, statements in the back uh, for your other funds, but GASB says we want to focus on the major or most significant funds. And, and for most school districts, uh, that would just be your general fund. And your general fund does also include your special education fund. Your, so when we look at your general fund, uh, it is a substantial part of the governmental funds. Uh, total assets of about 53 million. Uh, but when we look at uh, your governmental funds, we like to focus on your fund balance because fund balance is a uh, identification of uh, the strength of the district and the strength of the general fund. Uh, you can see that your fund balance at the end of 2014, June 30th, uh, in the general fund was about $31 million. Uh, you know, and, and so that was, that's an increase of about $7.5 million over the prior year. Uh, once again, 4.4 million of that is really that health insurance. So you can see as you move up that reserve restricted self-funded uh, health claims, uh, because you had some cost savings, you restrict those funds. And so even though you're showing a profit, that really is restricted for future claims. Uh, and uh, as a result, it, it is segregated uh, above. Uh, the rest of the budgetary, the rest of the increases was due to some budgetary savings that we'll talk about in a little bit. When I evaluate your fund balance, I, what I like to look at is your committed and unassigned, because those are funds uh, that you're really committing or you're really controlling right now. Uh, and you can see you have about 25, almost 26 million in those two categories, uh, which represents about 17% of your 2014 expenditures. Uh, last year, you're a little over 15%. So because of the good budget year, uh, you did have a slight increase. When we look at fund balances, our targets uh, for districts your size are somewhere from uh, 15 to 25%. You know, I mean, it's a little bit of a variety of a range depending on a number of different factors. Uh, so when we look at your district, uh, we believe you're right in the line with those uh, expectations. And the strong uh, fund balance position does allow you uh, to not have to short-term borrow. So most districts have to short-term borrow. Uh, and uh, you know, even though you, you're, you're showing increasing you know, cash flow as you're waiting for some of those state aids, uh, it gets a little tight at points in time during the year. So uh, your fund balance really provides that source of funding for okay, those cash okay, flows. Okay, quick question. When you, when you give that target of you'd like, I mean, typically not you, but your firm would say that the typical range would be 15 to 25%. We're at 17%. So when you say your typical range, you're, you're saying that typical range takes into account the restricted funds. If a district had the same self-funded health care 
you would subtract those restricted funds before you would hit our recommended right. range. Right. We, we focus on the controllable pieces of fund balance right. and uh, the, the restrictions or the non-spendable aren't, aren't controllable generally. So. Okay. So, and that restricted value of 4.4 is only there by a DPI recommendation? Is that what drives that restricted well, it, value? Well, it, it's based on how DPI requires you to record uh, the savings within your health plans. Okay. But I guess the general thing is that we're at 17%. We're kind of at the low end of the range. We're, we're, well, we just got you, up into the range where now we're in that acceptable area. Right. I would say most school districts aren't in that range. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, if I compare you, we're, that's where I'd like my school districts to be, oftentimes they're below that. Okay. So when I look at you in relation to ship to other schools, um, you know, I think your range is, is right in the, you're, you're right in the range on, on probably the mid to upper on, on the school districts your size. It's, it's taken us 20 years to get there. Yes. Well, I guess one of the, and I'll give it to Steve here in a second, one of, the, one of the concerns I have when we talk about the fund balance relative to health and health savings, generally when you have health savings, it affects premiums eventually. So. It's not like that's a sustainable thing to generate an improved fund balance through health savings relative to premiums and, paid. And that's why when I look at it, I don't consider those as part mm -hmm. of your range right. and your percentages because it could go down next year. Uh, it, it's more of a balancing from year to year in my mind. So. And maybe that's why you have a large range of 15 to 25 So right. because yep. it, it could be because of that right. if you have some money in there. Mr. Edlin. Thank you. Um, there's uh, there isn't any comparable data year to year, but uh, I guess maybe this would be a question more for administration. I believe two years ago we were at 17 million. Was that a combined restricted and unrestricted? We didn't have those categories broken down, so it was in total. It was in total, and 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 now, two years later, we're up to 34 million. 31. I'm looking at the next page, page 20. No, this total total fund balances from the previous page, 34. But that's one. all governmentals. Right. You're only looking at the general fund. It's 31. 31. Okay, even 31 from 17 to 31 in two years' time. That's incredible. But part of that is plan. I mean, the the, re the restriction for the health insurance was a known or was our target. We knew there was a surplus built into that budget. Mm -hmm assuming we didn't have a bad claims year. Okay. Are we, are we planning out our fund balance projections year to year? Uh, we don't, at this point, we don't have a planned growth in our fund balance. Are we planning to fund our insurance pool, our surplus funds that we need as reserve, our reserve for insurance? Uh, we do anticipate that we will in, be able to increase it this year, but it's, it's part of the premiums. So if we spend, if, if claims come in exactly what the premiums are that we would set, then no, it won't grow. Right, but there's other efficiencies within the budget that we're recognizing that will generate a surplus too, for instance, our transportation costs. But, so we, but we don't budget extra in transportation. We only budgeted what we anticipate this contract will cost us this year. Right, okay. I, I guess I'm using it as a comparison last year so this year we saved 1.2 million in our transportation costs so this year we'll probably be on track maybe a little less because the cost of diesel went down as compared to what it was two years ago so I'm still looking at it from perspective of this year we might save a million over what we saved last year um, only in certain areas because if you uh, also recall in this budget we added a lot of positions and those in essence are funded from savings from other places okay so so we look at we look at our budget. We build in a little extra so that hopefully and we won't have to use that by the end of the year. We really don't build in any extra. We we budget based on need. So our needs aren't as so last year we didn't need to tax eight million dollars. Um, no. <laughs> we, I guess what I'm trying to say is how how do we how do we plan year to year to grow the fund balance? I mean, that, that we do not. We do not. Okay. Unless we specifically built in a line item that 
had revenue in excess of expenditures so that it would flow to the bottom line. We do not intentionally build in a line to grow the fund balance. Okay. And the majority, you wouldn't, in your opinion, I guess the majority of the $8 million this year came from health insurance? No, four, well, 4.4 came from health. And then the rest is really a variety. Um, we know our buildings are allowed to carry over their allocations. So we're shy of a million? Six hundred twenty-seven thousand, correct? Yeah, like six, seven, um, yeah. So, for example, our buildings get an allocation on a per member basis. Um, if they do not spend it all, and in this case, thirteen fourteen, there was six hundred twenty-seven thousand, I believe, is the amount that they didn't spend. And so, as an incentive for them to spend prudently, we allow them to carry that over. So, this year, they will have six hundred twenty-seven thousand that is in last year's fund balance to be able to spend this year. Okay. okay. So, but so, so we but on paper you see of, that we could be taking money out of the fund balance this year. We would. So in that case, when we come and do the yeah. budget adjustments, you will see a one-sided entry, just the expenditure side for the six hundred twenty-seven thousand. Is that a policy decision or just an administration decision? Um, I do not believe it's a formal policy. It's past practice. Mm -hmm. That we've we have it. we have always granted. I I don't think, Mr. Edlin, it's unusual. One of the problems if you have this, where you either use your 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 discretionary funds as a site, or you lose them, then you have a bunch of spending at the end of the year that that may or may right. not be so in their best interest. It's actually better to have a carryover policy, which would add to our fund balance on a short-term basis, mm -hmm. but could end up with a bigger expenditure year to year. Mm -hmm. you know, more money, more uneven expenditures, but at least it'd be spent wisely. Should be, we be looking at capping that? I mean, at some point, if the money isn't needed on a specific site, if they've been frugal, that's wonderful, here's a reward, but... I think if you cap it, then you end up having people just spend it to avoid hitting the cap. I mean, that's, I mean, we can have that discussion. It really isn't part of the audit, but... Right. I mean, we could talk about that later. I mean, what I would say is, I would point out that Years ago, we had a board that, this is a long time before I was even a resident of the district, that decided fund balances were a bad thing and got us spent down to zero on our fund balance, okay? And that caused all sorts of problems. Now, we're at the range where we're down towards the minimum of what he would, or what our auditor would normally recommend, which he says isn't very common to even be at above the minimum, mm -hmm. but it sounds like we're in that range where we're probably I'm going to ask for the letter grade that Mr. Warren always asked to at the end, but I think our grade should be improving based on historically where we've sat for the last 10 or 15 years I've been involved with the board. Um, how we deal with our funds going forward is a day-to-day -day, day -day operation exercise. But I, the fund balance itself, the fact that we've been able to get up into, above that minimum level to me is a significantly positive development. Mr. Como. When we've had those uh, carryover discussions uh, for our sites in the past, one of the things that came up is sometimes schools uh, have bigger projects that they want to work on, and they don't have enough in one year to do that project. So it takes a couple years to save up to do whatever that project project is. And when you take a look at the 600 and some thousand dollars, and you divide that across you know, 15 elementary, three middle school, and three high schools, you're really not talking a, a, a ton of money per, per per school. But when we did go to allowing the carryover, um, we lost that attitude of, well, I better spend it or I'm going to lose it. And then people were just dinking and dunking on things at the end of the year trying to figure out how to spend it. And and that's just not a wise, a wise way to go. Um, I do have, David, I do have a question for you. Do you have a target range for how large are our reserve should be for a self-funded uh, health insurance uh, account? Do you have a, a magic typically, number there? Typically, you'd like percentage? to see a little history, a little more sure. history than one year. I mean, I, you know, I typically, I would, you know, one year is hard to target where you would be. Um, okay. Typically, you know, on an established plan, health insurance can fluctuate substantially from year to year, uh, and that's why you have to have a reserve. I mean, if I'm doing with some established plans, we usually are looking at reserves of anywhere from 30 to 40 to 45% of the reserves because of the, of the current year claims uh, as a 
adequate reserve somewhat. So 30 to 40 percent. Right. Just of, because of, of in one year, one I've seen years. claims go to take a lot, you know, but that's where you, you like to see a little bit more history before you come up with sure. that number. For, for the well, that 30 to 40 know. is the range that I was looking at just okay. to give us, because yep. this is our end of our first yep. year and we're trying to figure it out. Yep. <laughs> I understand. So. so I guess what you're saying out of that is that, you know, you would err on the conservative side because we only have one year of experience until we get the three to five years. We really don't know what our historical claims average out to be. I mean, Correct. normally. I mean, the, f the first year you tend to, because of legs, it tends to be a, a lower claim year just by everyone that goes in self-funding. The first year is generally a year where you build up a reserve just because of legs and things that do happen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, until you get a couple of years, it's, it's, you know, but yeah, I mean, I, I think. I think we had a two or three month leg and that helped us to build yep. up to where we are now. Wasn't that about what it was? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we, on our health care, we have the advantage of, you know, we're, we are, because of the nature of um, the last three to five years, we've had a big turnover in staff, you know, from one group of employees to a different group of employees. So we save money in some ways. In some ways, it costs us money because, you know, we have a different set of health care needs based on the group of employees we have today versus what we had three years ago. So it's, it's why you need that period of time before you actually know roughly what your claims are going to be on the average year to year because one year is not an average. Correct. Exactly. Right. Yep. Right. Okay. Then if we turn to page 21, uh, page 21 uh, is really the cumulative of what happened in the year. Uh, so it's a period of time once again. Uh, so you look, uh, as we talked about, your, your general fund did go up about $7.4 uh, almost 7.5 like we talked about. Once again, 4.4 is really related to health and 3.1 is really budgetary savings. Some of those are carried forward. Uh, when I look at the 3.1 uh, in, in surplus, you know, I often look at that percentage uh, to your expenditures and your, you know, your expenditures here are about 149 million. So 3.1 million to 149 million, you know, it gives you a one and a half percent or so budget variance. So you can have fluctuations from year to year. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, um, you do monitor that year to year. So any questions on that? Then the other governmental funds uh, did show an increase uh, of about 867,000 in total. Like I said, those are a number of funds. Uh, but the largest increase was really within your food service program. The food service program itself had an increase of about 600,000. The only question I have is that when we look at um Excess of revenues over, over or under expenditures, that was 2.5 million, but a significant portion of the net change in fund balances came from capital leases? Correct, and, but capital leases, the expenditures are above the line. Mm -hmm. So when you buy the computer, it's a shown as of an expenditure. A, a lease though itself, just like long-term debt is shown as a financing use or source. So even though it looks like the majority of that that ultimately finance expenditures that were above that line. Does that make sense? Well, I guess it would help to explain it. I mean, I understand we talk about there being a fund balance there, but those are capital expenditures that we pick up capital assets that we actually haven't paid for yet. They're on a lease. Correct. You, you, it means that you've acquired the, those assets are in use. They're related to the majority related to the Waukesha. Uh, initiative and also some IT issues and you pay for them through lease payments into the future so really that's time kind of, that's a that's a future obligation to pay for that five million dollars that's shown in our I mean we it's shown as a net change in fund balance but it's not really cash it is, it, it's a use, uh, it's a financing mechanism. It, you're right, it isn't, it, that five million didn't increase your cat fund balance position. Right. Because it's offset by expenditures. Yeah, and that's a big difference when you, when, yeah, and that, that's part of we're trying to look, you know, well, where, where's all this money at? Well, it's not there. It's not real. It's, it, it's yeah, real, it's but it's cash. not, it's not cash that I can actually say, it's here's five cash. million that I give back to the taxpayers because I have a future obligation to cover that. Correct. Right. You do okay. have a future obligation, yes. Okay. To fund it's almost payments. like our OPEP. Mm -hmm. 
sort of. <laughs> In a lot, I probably should. In a say little that bit of a, <laughs> it's a little bit different because you have an unknown, you have a known cost and a known repayment schedule. Yeah, that's true. In a short-term basis. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's why I use the word almost loosely. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other questions on that? So of a, of that big amount, we got five million on the capital lease program and four point four million, but that's the under that's the restricted value. But of that, it's really the five million that we really don't have cash associated with. If I would say again our fund balance in terms of um, what we really should be looking at is excess of revenues over expenditures at 2.5 million, that's real cash. I mean, it's real, the real cash is really 7.5. 7.5. You know, because if you didn't take out the capital leases, you wouldn't have 5.1 million of expenses above the line. So you, you, you in, in essence, it would be like, yeah, you buying something and then me giving you five million to pay for it. Uh, you expended it for services, so you spent out the cash, but then you got the financing. It doesn't impact the rest. Uh, it's kind of a zero wash on the fund balance. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any other questions? The uh, rest of the report uh, is various different notes uh, that are designed to complement the report. Uh, it goes through the various different long-term obligations. It goes through the uh, other post-employment benefits. It does go through the Wisconsin retirement disclosures. So these are all notes that are really designed to complement the report itself. So I don't know if anyone has any questions on any of the particular notes or want to go through any of the notes in particular. And then, the la like I said, the last part of the report is your single audit report. It tells uh, someone reviewing that says or sees that your federal and state financial assistance uh, that the district received uh, was properly spent and we had no compliance items that we are reporting. So, okay. Then if I could switch to the second document, uh, and the second document is titled Management Communications. Uh, and this is really our communication to the Board of Education. Uh, and uh, as we go through it, uh, it talks a little bit about uh, responsibilities and audit. Uh, that is really pages one, two, and three. Uh, it's an introductory letter. It talks about our responsibilities under uh, government audit, generally accepted auditing standards and also the single audit standards. So we did comply with those requirements. Uh, if we turn to page two, uh, it talks about internal control. Uh, as part, we just spent a little bit of time looking at financial balances of the district. Uh, as part of our audit, we also look at compliance with laws and regulations, specifically with federal and state programs, but also general uh, compliance with laws and regulations over your financial management, uh, like your debt levies and your debt service and, and your revenue limits. All those type of things are included in our audit. Uh, and we also look at your internal controls. We look at the processes and the procedures that you have, uh, that the district has placed into service uh, designed to safeguard the assets and the resources of the district. Uh, we're pleased to say that we did not have any internal control deficiencies that we had to report to the board or we had no compliance uh, exceptions or items of uh, non-compliance uh, that uh, we would have to report to the board. So. Uh, while it isn't an a, a opinion on those, uh, it does state that our testing of yours indicated that your control structure is designed uh, fairly effectively. Mr. Como. D David, could you uh, just briefly talk about what sample tests you did, you did do on us this year? Yes. Uh, we basically, when we looked at the balance sheet, our audit includes testing of all the material balance sheet accounts. So almost every account in the balance sheet, we verified through subsequent uh, observations of expenditures going out with respect to liabilities or cash balances at the end of the year, confirming your balances, confirming your investments. Uh, so from an, a balance sheet perspective, uh, we verify uh, the majority of your balance sheet accounts to make sure that they're appropriately recorded. Uh, from a control perspective, we take a uh, sample of both payroll disbursements, uh, general disbursements. Uh, we look at journal entries. Uh, we look at uh, uh, receipts. All those types of processes within the district 
uh, we re review the internal controls, meaning we take a sample of transactions just for the financial statement purposes and walk those through the financial statements to make sure that uh, from a control perspective, if there's appropriate controls over those transactions. So uh, we do sample on all testing, but that, that sampling is really designed to look at your controls. Because of the single audit, our, uh, our numbers of transactions expand uh, exponentially as we test compliance with appropriate uh, expenditures on your federal and state programs too. So we do additional testing on the controls over uh, the federal and state programs that you manage, which means uh, we, we select a sample from specific uh, transactions that relate to the grants and ver verify the controls over those grant transactions. Uh, and payroll transactions that relate to specifically people working in the federal and state grant programs. So our testing is really designed to, uh, you know, achieve a reasonable rate of, or a reasonable risk on uh, your controls over both your financial statements uh, and your controls over your federal and state grant compliance. And, and these, these tests take place over weeks? Um, with your team working with our Correct. team, yeah, we're, it's, we're, it's not it's a just two, like you're in in a couple hours. You take a few no. little quick samples and you're, and you're done, kind of thing. We we come in at two phases. Uh, we we do an, a preliminary phase, which involves reviewing minutes, reviewing some of the things. Uh, this year, because it was our first year, we had a, a meeting prior mm -hmm. to sure. uh, the audit. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of that preliminary is in discussions with with. Uh, Joe and Lori, uh, and then uh, we're here in two phases. So we're here in an interim phase uh, where we're doing work on, it, it's usually in the June time frame, uh, June or early July, uh, where we come in for a period of time, generally three to four days, and look at controls over that point in time. And then we come back in the August time frame to complete our audit testing. So uh, that is generally a four-day period, once again, with a team of four, four to five auditors here. Then the uh, last part of page two is the qualitative aspects of accounting practices. Uh, there are certain estimates that are embedded within the financial statements that we just went through. Uh, your other post-employment uh, obligations, uh, capital lives uh, incurred but not reported related to the insurance uh, and self-insurance. Uh, we do review those estimates and we believe them to be fair and reasonable. And then page three, uh, page three is almost a checklist of if we had any disagreements, if we had any concerns uh, in completing the audit. Uh, page three is where you would uh, really identify any significant other audit findings or other uh, disagreements or uh, uncorrected misstatements. So this would really be the page where uh, if there was a problem in our audit, in the completion of audit, it would be identified primarily on page three. Uh, from our perspective, uh, the audit went very well. Uh, the district was prepared when we came in. Uh, both phases, when we came in, the district was prepared. Uh, you know, as a first-year audit, uh, obviously, we're asking a lot of questions just to gather additional information uh, on the district and the processes and the procedures. Uh, and everything, from our perspective, went very well uh, for a first-year audit or for any audit. So uh, we certainly are appreciative of the effort. I mean, we spent a lot of time with... Uh, you know, the people in the finance area, um, but we also work with grants and people that are managing the grants and everyone was very cooperative in the completion of the audit, so uh, we do appreciate that. Okay. And then on page four, uh, page four is uh, we do have what we call other comments and observations, uh, and as I indicated, these aren't significant weaknesses, these aren't material weaknesses. Uh, but also, but just comments that as part of our review of your controls and part of the process, uh, we recommend that the district perhaps enhance some of the procedures. Uh, the first is on a new vendor uh, procedures, just ensuring that vendors being set up have there's appropriate checklists and uh, not, you know, our test of all your vendors had no problems. Uh, we're just recommending that perhaps additional controls could be in place uh, for new vendors, you know, as, as new vendors get inputted into the system. Uh, so, you know, not, not a significant area, but just an enhancement to your controls. And then comment two really deals with uh, looking at a fund balance policy with respect to GASB 54, and I know the district is in the process of reviewing it, uh, and I've reviewed a draft. So, you know, obviously the district is in that process of, of implementing that. Just one second here. Um Ms. Clifton, are you aware, I don't think we have a, do we have a vendor?
procedures document outlined in policy? We do not. Um, maybe that's something we should consider developing, um, our policy relative to vendor procedures and vendor. I, I think we have a bid, a policy on how to bid and when to on bid. Bidding. Um, but I think, you know, vendor, you know, nowadays, you know, in, in the business I'm in, um, we also have these vendor approval procedures like you're talking about. And there's a very set of parameters that each vendor is required to sign, you know, disclosure agreements in the case of the IP. And uh, sometimes it's just um, code of conduct. And maybe that's something we should take up with policy as far as looking at vendor procedures and processes just to add a little bit more substance. I, I think it's a good idea and it's, it's what other, it's what we do in my business anyway. Yep. And if you want to jump ahead to the management response, you'll see there's a checklist um, to create new vendors, and that was helped with the guidance of Lisa, who mm -hmm. uh, is with his staff. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be nice to have something in policy just to, you know, so we can have something carry over from special person to special person year to year. So. Okay, and then on starting on page five, six, and seven, uh, are really new uh, pronouncements or new changes that uh, will affect future reports. Uh, the first one on page five uh, deals with uh, the GASB 67 in the report in 68. Uh, 68 would be applicable for the district because you are participating in the Wisconsin Retirement Plan. Uh, GASB 68 will require additional disclosures above and beyond the disclosures that are currently in your financial statements, uh, and some of those disclosures will impact, excuse me, uh, the financial statements of the district. So uh, there are gonna be some enhancements. Uh, we will rely <coughs> on some of the information that we get from the Wisconsin Retirement System, uh, but there are some additional disclosures you will see in the future in additional financial statement lines. So just to make you aware of it. So Mr. that will Cromo. be a, and, and those need to go into play this next year? The next fiscal okay. year, yep, yep. Okay. So. And then uh, page six and seven uh, deal really with a new guidance that has been issued by the federal government related to grant management. Uh, and what they did is they consolidated policies and procedures out of a number of different circulars at the federal grant level, consolidated them in. Uh, there used to be different requirements uh, whether you are a governmental entity, a not-for-profit, a higher educational institution, uh, those really developed over a period of time. Uh, the new guidance really, uh, the uniform guidance really breaks it down into administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements. So uh, it breaks what was in uh, eight different circulars into one uh, called the uniform grant guidance. Uh, and goes through a number of different responsibilities, primarily responsible to, uh, you know, in, in essence, it, it came from um, some of the ARA funds and the concern about some of the accountability. Uh, so what you'll see is more emphasis on controls within organizations that are managing uh, federal and state grants. So uh, more in information on documentation. So uh, this will be effective not for this current year. It's really effective for any new grants received after uh, after December 26, 2014. So we're getting close to that. Uh, but because you're on a junior end, it's really gonna be the next June uh, when the majority of this will take in effect. So uh, it is something that you have some time to deal with. I know in discussions with DPI, uh, I have had some discussions on their processes and, and where they're at with it. And they're really treating it as, you know, really gonna become effective for your uh, next fiscal year. Yep. And the rest is just a management uh, representation where they disclose that they have provided us everything that we've asked for as part of the audit. So it's a standard communication that management does sign on an annual basis saying that they provided us all the information. So uh, like I indicated, uh, we certainly appreciate working with the district uh, and the audit from our perspective for a first year audit went very, very smoothly, very well. So we do appreciate that. Any questions? Um, when I look at this uh, new single audit requirements on page seven, um, it seems that they have a have a thing called high risk cap classification. 
Is there any other classifications besides a high risk classification that they concern themselves with, or is that just kind of one of those thresholds that they do an assessment on? Um, it used to there used to be high risk and low risk. Now they're high risk and other risk. So they changed the elimination of low risk uh, disclosures. Um, but the high risk classification has always really been there. They just have made some additional enhancements to the classifications and added additional descriptions. Okay, so a type A programs will be considered high risk if in the most recent audit period the program did not receive an unmodified opinion, had a material weakness in internal control, had known or likely question costs exceeding 5% of total. Any one of these three would apply for high risk? Correct. If, 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 if we, as, as part of our audit, if we had a, a type A program and we audited it and we could not give you an unqualified opinion on compliance, meaning there were material non-compliance issues that would necessitate a loss of low, or that would necessitate the uh, low risk on that program. And similar to material weakness, if you, you know, it's really designed so that if any auditor coming through has a problem that we can either issue an unqualified or unmodified opinion or material weakness, uh, it's probably saying that we should do more work is what that tells us. Okay. And just to be clear, we haven't. In no, the, yeah. you have not. <laughs> okay. Just in case anybody's watching. Yes. Okay. No, your, auto went, your single auto went very smoothly. Okay. Mr. Como? I just um, want to make a, a comment and uh, uh, kind of put this in perspective a little bit. As a governance board, uh, one of our most important responsibilities is the fiduciary responsibilities. We, we're the ones who represent the public, and one of the tasks is, is we have to make sure that our administrators are representing things appropriately from a number of different perspectives, whether it be policy or finance, um, and the list goes on. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't sit here day to day. Um, maybe some of you might see us on TV all the time and you think we're here all the time. But we are elected uh, public servants that, that serve a number of hours each month. And, uh, but one of the most awesome responsibilities is to make sure that we have an eye essentially on our administrators and that what they're telling us is accurate. And hence, we are really, de we are really dependent upon the auditor's report to dig into the details to make sure that we have the appropriate controls, uh, the checks and balances in place, and that everything that you represent to us each and every month, we gather every month in finance and facilities, we look at our, our reports, we talk about our projects, and um, this is just one more step in that process of making sure that, that what you're representing to us is, is, is accurate and true and um, you play a vital role in, you know, taking the, the microscope out and, uh, you know, taking a look, or at least a big magnifying glass, maybe not a microscope, <laughs> but a big magnifying glass to look at all the details. So thank you for those services. And what I heard you uh, say tonight was you gave a pretty stellar uh, uh, grade to, and I didn't hear a grade yet. Um, yeah, and you're not supposed to ask. I get to ask. We'll, we'll leave that up to you. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I heard Probably that our team has done a really good job with the representations that they have made to us throughout the year. That is correct. I mean, as part of our audit, we do review the minutes. We do review the correspondence. We look at a, a multitude of different things, too. And, uh, yeah, I mean, from our perspective, the audit went very well. And the... Uh, staff that we work with were very qualified uh, in the completion of their responsibilities here. Okay, and, and it's a requirement that we bring you in as an independent uh, organization to take a look at us because, um, you know, we have to identify if there's fraud or, you know, other things that are going on that shouldn't be going on. And um, I, just, I just wanted to thank you for that detailed effort um, because, first of all, we're not qualified to take a look at things in, uh, in, in, in that much detail, and um, we don't have the time either. <laughs> so we're very dependent upon what you and other auditors do each and every year, so thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, just to point out, um, I think this is the longest representation letter I've ever seen. <laughs> hmm? 
Uh, we have 51 items that uh, um, Ms. Clifton and uh, Mr. Uh, Sikora signed off on. And on that 51, item number 50 goes, has subletters A through V as in Victor. Um, so I'm sure this uh, format was something that was um, is standard transmittal from the auditors for um, as part of your engagement. Right. I mean, this is primarily designed by the AICPA and the various different. The one that is goes on for for a long period of time relates to your single audit because there's a lot of different representations that occur in there. Okay. Yep. So in this and this. I'll follow up on that. The uh, the letter that I would have signed every year was basically that same letter. It just hasn't been attached for as part of the representation letter in the past. Okay, well, I think it's a good idea to attach it because it's it's you know, obviously it's it's what is required from the auditors to make sure that you sign off that you've given them the information that's covered within this document. So. But has that letter always been this long? Um. Not much different. Uh, this one might be a little more detailed. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Was there more to? <laughs> well, any other questions from the committee? You have one. Well, you have one. <laughs> well, I'll do that after uh, after I hear management's response from the 2013-2014 audit. I guess. You know, now give us a response. Um, and I think we've pretty much covered it. The two items were the um, vendor checklist, a formal process. So in your packet is the revised form that we are now using. Um, the only piece on here I want to say that we have added that probably didn't come on the template is that we are now asking employees to verify that they do not have a conflict of interest, personal relationship, or a financial gain in selecting this vendor. Um, in the past, we did not have a mechanism to uh, ask the question because it was simply emails going back and forth asking for new vendors. So we are starting to, as you alluded to earlier, creating more formal processes and documentation. Okay. Uh, any Did questions on that you? one? Any questions from Ms. Clifton before I asked for judgment? One, one more. Uh, and then on the fund balance reporting, uh, you saw that uh, last month, the revision mm -hmm. uh, that will go to policy um, or has gone to policy, and you will see it uh, Wednesday night at the board meeting. Okay. So uh, when we do the audit report, um, it's been kind of a historical thing by the previous uh, FNF chair and the board chairman at the time, Mr. Warren. He always thinks of us as a school district and, we, and he was kind of old fashioned. He liked letter grades. <laughs> and, and, and usually he always asks the auditor to give a letter grade for the district and usually that letter grade is relative to, you know, other government entities or other school districts that you deal with. And, and uh, the, the traditional eighth all the way down to F. We're hoping you don't give us an F today. Uh, where would you rate this district from a let? And you can give us, you can use pluses and minuses, by the yep. way. Yep. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, the district, and I'm, are we talking financial, people, everything? Uh, <laughs> overall, he, gives, he, he used an overall letter okay. grade, but <laughs> we can start breaking it down if you'd like. Just but. clarify. <laughs> so. um, you know, financially and Organizationally, uh, I think the district's in a very good position. I mean, we talked a little bit about the positive financial balances. Um, you know, I guess organizationally, the people we worked with were very qualified, and, and the audit went very well for our first year. So, from a great perspective, I would probably say an A minus. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know, A, a minus. I mean, I I've never asked to. I've never. Given a grade per, per se. <laughs> you, haven't <laughs> a little, Wa you haven't worked at Waukesha before. You're not so, a <laughs> so, I mean, but, but when I look at the, the you know, the uh, uh, responsiveness, uh, the readiness, uh, um, you know, sometimes when we walk into a first year audit, um, you know, when we don't know, sometimes it's a little bit harder, you know, as an auditor, you know, what are we going to walk into? And it was very easy walking into this district. 
uh, and very easy to get the audit done. So, you know, I, I think from that perspective, I certainly would give it A, A minus. Okay. Well, in that respect, I think what happened was when, when I think when Mr. Gray came on board, uh, we switched auditors um, either shortly before or shortly after Mr. Gray came on board. And that auditor switch helped create um, the situation you walked into. Because prior to that, I don't think we had the depth of preparation for the audit. Okay. And with the last group of auditors, um, that improved a great deal. And one of the reasons why we said after that is, you know, we shouldn't just keep the same auditor every year. We should do more transition of auditors so that we get a more diverse set of opinions. Because prior to that, we were just using the same auditor every year, and it, and the quality of the report really wasn't, it wasn't really very good mm -hmm. relative to what we received subsequent to changing auditors. So, and when we changed auditors this time, I said it wasn't a matter of having bad service from the previous auditor. Mm -hmm. It was just that our prior history was is we should be um, using different auditors over time. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from board members? Mr. Edlin. That doesn't mean we're not going to invite you back next year. <laughs> <laughs> had to say that. I, do well, we, we have a three year contract? Yeah, three, three. We have two more years on the contract. <laughs> I'll leave it to Steve to want to break the contract. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said every year. I just, you know, I wanted to know he did a good job, and you're welcome to come back next year. He has a good contract. Job and good luck. He has a contract. <laughs> good luck on the bid. <laughs> Make sure you fill out that vendor form. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. <laughs> Go back and watch the tape. <laughs> I don't watch tapes. Either. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for all that. That was very good. Um, now we're on to information item number two, our monthly budget up update, Mrs. Okay. Sikora. A recap of uh, the October um, financial statement. There was not a significant amount of revenue activity in the month. So just um, really going down to the bottom line in the revenue. Overall in the general fund, the districts received 6.04% of the annual fiscal year-to-date revenues, similar to last year at this time. The only um, material difference between this year and last year was that in July of 2013, we had a capital lease entry at 2.2%. Two million to reflect the value of the Apple equipment received. So um, that was the major difference between the two years. Going into our expenditures, looking at our difference from last year in salaries and benefits, the reason for that difference in, in year-to-date salaries for teachers is due to the accrued 2012-13 um, teacher retro pay of 1.2 million in salaries and 173,000 in benefits. That was reversed in September 2013. And then the teacher retro pay was actually then paid in November 2013. So in the next statement, you'll see that the two um, year-to-dates will, will be very similar. In purchase servicers, the year-to-date difference is just due to um, a timing in the electric utilities. We had um, received the invoices earlier this year, so that's why there's the difference. The actual, um, the actual bills will be very similar once, once the timing is caught up. And then in November, we will get all of our transportation invoices entered. There was a lot of route changes, so the first student worked with um, our transportation department to go through all those routing changes. But then you'll see, as, as we did budget, there will be some savings in transportation costs from last year due to a reduction in the number of routes. And then Mr. Como, How did the route changes come about? Was it... Um Request by parents, request by our staff, um, first student brought, brought some up. Kind of talk through that a little bit. Uh, a lot of that takes place over the summer, given uh, who's going to be routed. And most of those savings came in special education routes. Just so we're clear, it's not the big bus um, normal route. Uh, that doesn't change much year to year. But we did have a major reduction in the number of the smaller special education buses. Were we able to combine students, multiple students? Exactly. Okay. Um, we have better relationship with uh, student services side of the equation. So as students are routed, uh, we try to now stay away from those special um, late start, early dismissal schedules mm -hmm. that in the past had 
been pretty common. So that almost uh, pre precluded bunching kids up on a given bus. Um, so we're getting away from the one bus per kid child r arrangement. Okay. So you're seeing a lot of that savings starting to come to fruition. And in, in the cases, in some cases too, where we might have just a one-to-one -one ratio, do we have contracts for, for um, uh, families at all for that or not? Uh, it's an option we look at, but the way we are now structured, um, it doesn't cost us any more to send the bus out four times a day versus one time a day. Uh, we contract for a bus for four hours on any given day. And how we choose to utilize that four hours is up to us. Okay. So we have a lot more flexibility. And, and so as we're learning the software, um, uh, Yvonne Johnson in our transportation department does a marvelous job um, with working with those schedulings um, and trying to get the pairings so that we don't need to send out additional buses. We just utilize the ones we have. And that's something that's new when we move to first student also is having that ability to in actually house. see the schedule, see the routes, try and, ha and have input uh, yeah. from our end, right? It, it's a very transparent uh, process. Last year, you know, we had such a short turnaround time. We pretty much had to take um, the previous year and roll forward and we've been able to tweak that, and then this summer, I kind of totally blow it apart and, and, and re-piece it back together. Okay, good, that's good news. Just, just a point of clarification on that. Was that, I'm trying to remember from the past, but I don't recall in the past that we had a person trying to manage load utilization. Correct, we relied on um, the prior carrier to do all the routing uh, and it's like didn't see a lot of the transparency. Yeah, okay. So the, this, we had to add staff or add work to staff for us to. We actually created a position um, specifically for this purpose, and it is certainly paid for itself. Okay, Mr. Edlin. Thank you, Mr. Um, Ms. Clifton. Last year we um, had transitioned from our diesel buses with a different contractor to propane buses, and we had. Uh, logistics issues with them not having an on-site propane tank until almost the end of the school year or three-quarters of the way through and it became burdensome in some place I guess some opinions to have to bring in uh, a truck to refuel the buses every day twice a day um, and now they have the big tank established and we're able to fill that up and it lasts a whole lot longer than making individual deliveries is were we were they eating that expense last year they were okay so this is going to be more profitable year for them too and um. I, I don't know if um, their agreement with feral gas included that as an extra uh, you know an upcharge um, or if because they have a long range contract with feral and it's a national contract mm -hmm. if they were to work out some kind of agreement and on that interim um, on-site filling okay have we had any interest from other districts about how the programs worked out uh, individual inquiries no Really, it's amazing. Successful as it's been for us, I can't believe there hasn't been more interest. Well, and until they actually put their contracts up for bid, it might not be a conversation. Sure, thank you. So overall in the, overall in the general fund, the districts has spent 26.17 million year to date, or 18.04% of the budget compared to 25.94 million or 18.63% expended by the same time last year. And then the special education fund has also been included for your, your review. Our first um, revenues received were in the month of October. We received $219,000 in IDEA flow through grants and $3,658 in forward health payments. And then again, the reason for the difference in the year to date salaries is due to um, the teacher retro pay in the previous year, which will even out in the month of November. So that's the report. And um, as we go through the year, we'll just, we'll have much, we have much more revenue figures to report as we come through. Right now we're at like 6% year to date. So the revenue activity will increase quite a bit as we move forward through the year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Como. The uh, change in the GASB reporting for, um, grants 
Is that going to have an impact on these reports? Or? It will not. Okay. It's just a detail month that's month supplied to them? Correct. Okay. Um, the more disclosure information. Um, as we internally manage our grants and, and approve oh. or disapprove items that fall under grants, we might have to um, maybe in, internally change some of our procedures on how we approve expenditures, but you won't see an impact. On the report here. On the okay. Report, correct. Okay. Thank you. And then the last, just the last page of the whole report is just an update on the health claims payable for the year. You see, we've got four months in, and we're average, averaging claims of 1.5 million a month. 1.5 million per month. So, just for kicks and giggles, you can look at between August and September, and you'll see what the swing can be in a given month. There's a difference there of about 600,000 of claims one month to the next. So. Okay, let's move on to the next information item, which is a resolution awarding the sale of $8 million of general obligation promissory notes. Um, it's an informational item tonight because the bids will actually are being solicited Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock, they are due. Um, so there will be a presentation at the full board level uh, with the awarding uh, bid. Uh, what I did want to point out is we went out for rating uh, what was standard and poor's. I uh, haven't had a rating for quite some time, uh, but you'll see they did come back and award us a double A. Um, that is comparable to a double A2 on the Moody scale. Uh, standard and poor's uses a plus and a minus system. So, um, so we're, I personally am happy with this one. So. Sounds like you thought we should have had better, though, right? Well, I would have liked the plus. Mm -hmm. um, but based on their criteria, uh, it doesn't appear we're going to get one, and those are factors beyond our control. Um, the, the wealth supporting our students um, and the income coming into the district, which is obviously most of it comes in under the revenue cap, so there's not a lot we can do there. Um, I would like to point out on their report, um, and I'm sorry I did not highlight it. <coughs> Let me under outlooks I believe it is um, we we could take a negative rating action if unforeseen budgetary pressure were to cause the district to draw on reserves significantly so they are factoring in our fund balance um, and they like it as is I guess is the way to summarize their uh, their conclusions so and that will re be reflected in the bids for our debt We'll see what rate gets bid relative to our ratings and stuff like that. Uh, for Wisconsin school districts, a double A is, is a strong rating. So we should see very favorable returns. Okay. Mr. Coleman. Yeah, I think it was stated that there were very few that received triple A, right, in our state? Like, just a few. Uh, yeah, and if I were to guess, I would say Madison, maybe, uh, in Milwaukee. But yeah. So, so triple A's aren't, aren't handed out really in, in this state. And that takes in many factors, you know, the, the economy, um, what the tax base is, all sorts of things. So this is, this is, a, this is a fascinating to go through this report. Um, I also um, think that we're taking some strong action with respect to our, our, our policy uh, for, for fund balance. And we're gonna make that stronger um, they looked at that as being favorable, the action that we potentially could take. They looked at that favorably, so I think that was, that was a good step for us. Um, and I also, um, and that's where I got the $58 million uh, for our accrued okay. OPEB unfunded liability. Um, they also pointed out that it was $58 million. And that is down, as we pointed out, for various reasons, from the $195 million just a handful of years ago. Um, so we're, we're working at that hard. Um, and uh, there's been a number of things that happened to allow us to, to get to that point. And we're going to continue to talk through some of that uh, this evening and, and in the future months, too. 
Um, but this is the first year, we've talked on fund balance a lot the last couple of months. This is the first year we've been in this position where we've been looked at favorably. Um, it's taken 20 years to get there. And it's 20 years of hard work and of a lot of administrative uh, changes. And so um, we're, we're hopefully going to start to reap some of the rewards of that hard work here. Um, first thing this year is we don't have to do a short-term borrow. That's one reward. And hopefully, with the AA rating, we'll find, as Mr. O'Brien said, we'll find some favorable uh, interest rates here. So uh, we'll find out soon, days. in two days, yes. yes. So if, if, you know, this report I found fascinating, all the components that they took into consideration for our rating, and uh, it has been a number of years since we've had one. So it was, it was good to see uh, where we're viewed at being right now. And it's favorable. Okay, any other comments from committee members? Okay, is that all we have to discuss on the resolution? Mr. Como. I think I had one or two areas I wanted to explain. Yeah, if we were to look at, uh, at the resolution mm -hmm. on page two, at the very bottom of page two of the resolution, section three, will you explain that? The note shall not be subject to optional redemption. It means they can't be called early. Um, so if for whatever reason we had a windfall and wanted to pay them off early, we would not be able to. Is that standard? Is that typical? It is for a short term, like this, with because it's only seven years, uh, that's pretty typical because otherwise you pay a premium um, to have them be callable. Okay. Uh, now, if we were issuing 10 or 20 year, typically those last years you have a callable feature. Okay. Because interest rates can fluctuate over that period of time. But under this shorter seven year window, the investor wants to know that if they purchase these, they've kind of got it locked in. Yeah, yeah. So this is common. This yes. is, th that's yes, common. For, for this short of a, of a long term debt it is. Okay. And then um, also the same if we could turn to page seven, section 19, it's talking on bond insurance. If you could just maybe explain a little bit on that. Do we have to take it? It sounds like we might have to take it, but we're not sure. And if we do, it kind of talks through what they expect. That's a common feature. Uh, a lot of times it depends on the underwriter. So if they want to turn around and market these as AAA, they'll require that we buy bond insurance that brings it up to the guaranteed AAA rating. Okay. Um, so that's what the insurance would do. So that, that really is a factor of the bidder um, and what their plans are for these uh, bonds. And we won't know. So this gives us the flexibility to take the action if we need to take action. It gives the bidder the flexibility to um, the bidder, yeah. require, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, require the interest and or require the insurance, and and then those costs would be built into the the borrowing costs if okay. that's a requirement. Okay. So we will see that then. We'll know that on Wednesday. Correct. If if it's built into the bids or not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So during the uh, presentation, during the full board for F and F, uh, Mr. Ryan, would you then? I, I'm assuming you will introduce our presenters who will give the bid results. Yes. And I then will, provide a motion. Yeah, put it into the normal okay. setup, and um. that's how we agendized it too. Was through F and F committee yeah. report. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's how we agenda it. Yeah, so bring, it'll be the only action item. Yeah, I didn't bring the agenda with me. Am I, am I at the I, front end of the agenda or the back end of the agenda? Uh, we're early. We're early this time? Or are you just keeping their people there all night long? We are number four. We're number four. Okay. Just make everybody else's report real short, Joe. <laughs> I, got, I got a magic <laughs> wand to do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is 4A1 on the board agenda, so <laughs> it, it will be early. And it's, it's, a, it's a rotational thing, too. So we actually rotate what committee talks when. So kind of 
Uh, I don't fair. I don't care about the order as long as the other people are really short. <laughs> number one. <laughs> I'm number one on that. Number one. So, you know, we're number one, so I guess it doesn't matter. I would be last. Mr. Edlin. Thank you. Um, Looking at the credit profile and reading over, there was a, a mm -hmm. note in here that kind of caught my attention. It says that we have a formal investment policy, but we don't have a formal debt management policy. Is that something that's usually on the books with other districts? It is not. Um, it, because I had to ask for clarification on what a debt policy is uh, and ask for a copy of one, and PMA said they're not aware of anybody who has one. Thank you. Uh, and PMA will be presenting uh, for Wednesday. Michelle? Yes. Okay. Uh, I believe Michelle will be bringing the bids. Okay. okay. Any other questions? As I recall, I was the last one to present at the last board meeting, so I guess I would be the first one. Correct. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, if that's no other questions on the information item, we can go right to the, to the big event tonight, which is discussion items on retirement and health benefit options. And we've had some important guests that have been waiting to speak to us or help us with this discussion. So we have a PowerPoint presentation that's um, been prepared between the district and Benico. Um, Justin and Jeff are here to guide us through it. Uh, both of those mics should work, so make yourself comfortable. Chris is also with us this evening. She's been instrumental in pulling together information for the PowerPoint as well. And if I'm guessing she's going to run the clicker. <laughs> so um, we've been charged with coming up with a way of, of funding OPEB. Um, and transitioning to a high deductible health plan. So what we are going to share with you are the fruits of, of conversations we've been having, discussions, um, and some of the obstacles maybe that we've been running into. So we're, we're, we're in a sharing mode tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over. Um, hi, everybody. I just want to introduce to you our representatives from Benico. Um, to my left is Justin Andaloro, and uh, to his left is Jeff Schultz, mm -hmm. and they have been the um, people that have been helping us work through some of the, It's a very complex process, as you'll s soon see. I know that you've received copies of the PowerPoint in your packets this weekend, so if uh, you didn't if you didn't have a chance to take a look at that, that's okay. We're, we're going to go through it with you this evening. Uh, we see this as a multi-step process. We're going to give you some 30,000 foot level information and then um, move on from there based on our discussion back and forth. The whole idea is to provide um, a benefit that will help to be used as a retention tool uh, to um, also, uh, I think it's in the slide, but um, make our school district a, a district of choice, provide something for our employees so that they understand what they're going to be um, leaving with and um, something that's also going to be affordable and something that will um, take care of the OPEB liability. So. Um, cash flow, Laurie, do you want to talk about this slide, what this, what this means right now?
So remember that term, implicit so beyond subs. Beyond the WRS, is that what we're saying? Correct. It's just health insurance. Right. Oh. We're talking just health insurance. Oh. Here. oh okay. So if you have retirees, there's a higher cost for carrying the retirees. Correct. So just remember that term, implicit subsidy. We're going to be coming back to that a little bit later. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're looking to make some changes to the current retirement benefit, but not remove it. Uh, we need to address the uh, OPEB liability. And uh, one of the reasons we asked our friends from Beneco to be here is to talk about all of those things um, in that third bullet point because this is where it just gets really complex but long term uh, we have a long-term strategy as you know uh, we we uh, this is going to involve our health insurance plan design and in order to try to keep this uh, plan design at a rate that we will be in compliance with the affordable care act and avoid the cadillac tax um, we we need to uh, very carefully look at all of those components in conjunction with the retirement benefit. So. And, and when we say we, I mean this is important not only from a district perspective, but from a empl an employee perspective, <clears throat> right? From when you look, take a look at the Cadillac, the Cadillac uh, tax that could be coming up, that'll have an impact on each employee. Um, so when we start to talk about trying to um, figure out what, what's the best route to go to meet all these, all these goals, sometimes they're at odds with one another too. And, and so what we're trying to do, we're trying to figure out what's best for the district um, as a whole um, while we're balancing all these things out, Correct. taking the employees also into consideration. Right? I mean, it's, it's. That's correct. And one of the, so, you know, going back a few years and looking at our plan design, we moved from the EAW to United Healthcare. There was um, some cost savings there, and we didn't change the plan design. Mm -hmm. um, then we, we moved forward to uh, try to contain some of those costs by making some tweaks to the plan design. And um, uh, we've done that over the last several years. So I would say that every year there's something that we're looking to do in order to try to uh, stem the tide or address the trend, so to speak. And the trend is, correct me if I'm wrong, it's between 8 to 10 percent per year, mm -hmm. right? So if we're looking at a trend on a $20,000 a an year. An increase in premium. Increase in yep. premium, yep. right. Uh, and if we're looking at a $20,000 a year family insurance plan, 8 to 10 percent will um, grow very quickly. So that's why we've had to look at our insurance plan design. And it, as you can um, as you know, we're looking at a high deductible health plan, but we need to create something, again, with the employees in mind, you know, what is going to be their total out-of-pocket exposure and what kinds of things can we do to minimize the impact on the employee while at the same time um, keeping that cost of the benefit uh, down so we can avoid the Cadillac tax, we can be in compliance with the ACA. So you, you're getting the idea about how um, complicated it can be and, and it and just when you think you're you're following me, all of a sudden we're going to use things like HSA and HRA and TSA and um, that just gets into a whole other ball of wax. So you'll see why we're just giving you the 30,000 foot level tonight. Um, our goal, obviously, is to implement a retirement account and what that looks like, HRA, TSA, whatever it is. We need to determine that, but it's going to eventually replace the current defined benefit plan. Um, the defined benefit plan being $75,000 used to purchase health insurance in retirement. Um, for some of our employee groups, that $75,000 can also be used to um, purchase up to two years of actuarial uh, age penalties through WRS, but we're not even gonna talk about that tonight. I don't wanna complicate this conversation, okay? So let's just say that our defined benefit is 75,000 to be used for the cost of health insurance in retirement and um, phase that out and replace it with a defined contribution plan. 
And so w our, our goal is to help you understand what that looks like tonight. Uh, I know, just before you go off, because I think there's a, when I see that, that 75,000, because I know why it's there. You're not on the mic. Yeah, the mic. <laughs> when I see that 75,000, I know why it's there. It was, it was part of what, we used to not have a cap on that. And what, right. what we ended up doing in our last contract with EAW was part of the agreement was to, to cap that number to cover all post employment like the WRS. And, and the, problem, the problem I have with calling it a defined benefit relative to when you just lump it into health care, it doesn't, you know, it, it was only spent, let's say, if the person, it was a maximum benefit that they could, it, not everybody got that 75000 You know, things could happen where they didn't pull the full 75000 um, maybe they didn't have the expenses to take the full 75000 during that time. It's a technical term. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're using the term defined term. benefit as... Um, That's uh, yeah, yeah. How is it structured? Pardon me? How is the benefit structured? I think she's trying to avoid that complication. I mean, I can tell you they had up to eight years to use it. Okay. Um, so it had an a end date. It did have an end date. So it was capped at 75000 and it had an end date. Right. Yeah. Which, that, that putting that cap on that benefit was probably the biggest, first big shift in our OPEB obligations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because before that, there wasn't a cap. It was wide open. And so by putting the cap on is, so there was a benefit to having a defined benefit defined at 75000 before it wasn't defined. The cost escalation of health care. It was three years full coverage, yeah. the next two years at the third year's rate, um, and then they could cash in sick But leave that's not defined by, that's, that's not, not a, yeah. it, that's coverage not a can be anything. It's not a concrete yeah. number. Yeah. So the idea was to give a concrete number that would limit our OPEB obligations. Right. Right. Something we could but, budget against. But define, I think defined benefit is technically, a, it's a technical term saying what this truly is, right? I mean, it is a defined it's a what type of plan. Benefit type could, of we, plan. could we define right. this? By the gov right. Defined by the government. Defined by right. definition of defined. So sure. Oh, go ahead, Lori. I was going to say, as opposed to a defined contribution, is the other side of the coin. <clears throat> so we've defined a benefit uh, in terms of dollars and timing and things like that. But we're, what we're talking about is, is really nailing down very specifically what the amount, the contribution to all future potential retirees may be so that you can accurately reflect that in your in your liability because right now as you've indicated it, it's to a maximum of seventy five thousand dollars and it could be stretched over a period of time what what we're going to try to um, uh, you know sort of open the conversation about is a specific dollar amount that you can take to the bank and say our liability is x it's not going to vary and, and that's sort of the goal in the whole defined contribution. It's not much different, just transition, if you will. Uh, we're talking about health insurance here, but transition to the old pension plan days, to the 401k days. The, the defined benefit of X amount of years of uh, salary replacement to X amount of contribution by the employer as a 401k match or profit sharing, et cetera. So, Parallel that as we as we talk through. I I guess I have a problem with that characterization because in the case in this case what we really kind of said is here's seventy five thousand dollars that really is a promise of seventy five thousand sometime in the future when you retire. It didn't have an escalator on it. It was seventy five thousand dollars. So whether you were employed in year five in the district or year 25 in the district, all you were promised or assured of was $75,000, providing you made it to the retirement age under those set terms and conditions. And uh, it's more like, instead of being a, like a, something that's variable, like a, a salary or uh, insurance, because insurance goes up, salaries go up, different things go up, it's almost like setting up a, health, a savings account a guaranteed savings account of $75,000 to be used for expenses or for some sort of retirement benefit over an eight-year period. 
So it was a fixed amount. The problem is, is if we change it from a fixed amount in the future and roll that into today, it makes those dollars more expensive because future dollars are cheaper than today's dollars. You know, I, I guess we're getting caught up in defined benefit, defined contribution. Right. I think maybe if we could go to the concepts, I, you know, because okay. everybody comes in with a different perspective and different definition, I, I would just encourage us to do that because we might be able to sit and just talk through that for the, for the rest of our time. Okay. That's all right? Sure. The assumption. The assumptions that we're making here are based on a discussion that we had with the Board of Education at a work session like a year and a half or two years ago. It was a long, it was a long while ago. And since then, we've been working um, to try to develop something that is uh, affordable and meets all of the uh, goals that we're setting for ourselves. So one of the things that we heard was that there was some interest in grandfathering some employees. So, uh, you know, whether it's uh, everyone who would be eligible for retirement right now would be grandfathered in, uh, everyone who would be eligible uh, within five years, and, you know, from now until within five years or from now until 10 years, there'd be a grandfathering of um, some of these employees so that they would have the plan that has been in place since it was um, bargained in in the 10-11 uh, contract, 09-11 contract, and, um, uh, you know, then they would know what they've uh, had and they could go with that. Transitional employees would be people that would be somewhere between brand new employees and those grandfathered employees and there would be uh, somewhat of a phase out of the current plan and a phase in of the other plans so that there wouldn't be necessarily uh, a sharp reduction in the benefit but there would be an opportunity to um, have a portion of the traditional district benefit combined with whatever the new benefit would be so that there would be a similar amount for those employees and then for new employees or employees that have say more than uh, that have more than 20 years before retirement uh, would be uh, completely on the new plan so that's how we were looking at this basically three groups of employees varying levels of transition um, and we did work with Steve Hansen from Milliman to develop a plan that would reduce our OPEB or eliminate our OPEB benefit and fully fund this um, over the next, uh, well, I guess he figured it to be about 2054. So the considerations that we've discussed, and believe me, we've discussed them for hours and hours, <laughs> Um, were how much to contribute to employees and when, uh, how long the benefit, the benefit eligibility duration, so how long someone would be eligible for a particular benefit, where to get um, coverage, uh, health insurance coverage, is this the district coverage, would they go on to the exchanges and get coverage, we talked about all of that. Um, retired employees, would they be that's where, where to get the coverage. Would they be on our plan? Would they be off our plan? Um, and I'm skipping a bullet here, the implicit subsidy rate impact. So if you're a retiree and you're on a plan and statistically you are more expensive to have on the plan, then would the retiree rate be a different rate than the active employee rate? Right now it's not, but many school districts are going to um, these separate rates where the employee, the retirement rate is higher to um, take the subsidy off the actives and then the actives would be paying a lower rate. Um, the future of the actuarial reduction penalty benefit, which is the last time I'm mentioning that here tonight, we can talk about it later, but I don't think it's going to be our topic tonight. Um, the whole uh, defined benefit, defined contribution conversation, 
uh, which vehicle is best, meaning is it a TSA, a 403B, or is it a, a 457, or is it a, an HRA or an HSA, and we, we're going to talk about what the differences are. And um, we can differentiate by group of employees. So administrators could have one benefit, teachers another, support staff another benefit. So these are all the considerations that are swirling um, around this discussion. This is where we're getting into the nitty gritty, folks. Um, district contributions uh, and We'll just see where we're at here. So. I'm trying to decide the best way to discuss this slide. Um, the assumptions that were made in coming up with a plan, and this was uh, Steve Hansen creating this plan uh, that you know, we could actually put numbers to and say this is how it would work and this is how, what we would have to pay for it and this is how we would fully fund it. The assumptions are that um, annual district contributions would be made to a retirement savings account, whether that's HSA, HRA, whatever it is, while the employee is active. And then after um, the employee exhausts their retirement amount, so say the $75,000, the member would be no longer eligible for the district plan. So right now, an employee that has used up their retirement benefit can stay on our plan, but they receive a bill from UHC. Okay. In this assumption, they wouldn't be able to do that. They would have to, we would have to give them other options for insurance. Um, Retiree premiums counting against the district benefit would be paid at self-supporting rates. That's the implicit subsidy. So those, that was another assumption that um, was made when the numbers were being crunched, that the retiree premiums would be higher than the actives. And um, all employee groups would be subject to the benefit cap, including those who currently have a cap stated in years. That is. Um, uh, Steve Hansen from Milliman just looking at what do we have right now and let's just keep this cap. Did I say that okay, Lori? Yeah, okay. All right. So who owns the savings vehicle? That's to be determined Depends. depending on the vehicle. That's a pretty big assumption as well, who would own it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, depending on whether it's an HSA versus an HRA determines okay. ownership. Right, okay. And then how about can the employee... Um, contribute to themselves? Another assumption. Depends. Another assumption. <laughs> okay. um, I you wish you Todd was here. to understand the fund we've been having. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish Todd was here because this is um, actually a depiction of uh, something that he scratched on the whiteboard in the other room and said, this is what I, we, you know, our goal really needs to be. So the uh, green portion is the the district plan and using uh, a proposed method for moving away from the 75,000 and moving into a um, annual contribution into an employee's account that uh, we would dis we would decrease that those contributions over a period of years. Meanwhile, we would be increasing contributions into another savings vehicle so that people in these transition years are receiving um, you know both uh, both kinds of benefits and it, the farther are, out you are from retirement the closer you are to receiving the new benefit or more of the new benefit and as far as the amounts go the person that retires in 2040, for example, that amount could be higher or lower. It's just, it depends on what we decide. This is just for an, this is an illustration only so that you can understand what we're talking about. People that are within five years of retirement, they would receive the, um, the 75,000 and then moving further away from that, the others would receive a combination of the two benefits. Does that make sense? 
sense. I, I, I guess I have a hard time with the overall concept. If, right now, that benefit's payable upon retirement. That's when they draw that $75,000. Right. Correct. Okay. And to convert it into a different way, we'd be paying it throughout their employment. Right. Okay. Depending upon how we do it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, let's say a, an employee that retires uh, in 2040, $75,000 in 2040 is going to mean almost nothing. And if we move it from the flat rate of 75000 to a HSA type arrangement, that money is going to go much greater and much larger than the 75000 that's promised to them today. So I don't see the savings, I don't see the savings coming to the district over the long run if we go to that type of conversion. And, and that's, that's just, maybe I'm looking at it wrong, but that's just kind of the way I'm. Well, keep in mind, one of our goals was try to eliminate the OPEB liability. And in either you have no retirement benefit, which makes it go away, um, or you start actually putting money aside now to fund it. So that was one of the assumptions, is that we would go more f to a defined contribution saying, I'll put X aside. Where it ends up at retirement is purely a, a combination of your years of service or um, interest rates or whatever, but we're not guaranteeing you an end result. Well, if that's one of our goals, to eliminate the OPEB liability, I'm not sure that's the proper goal, because mm -hmm. having an OPEB liability is not a problem. It's whether it's funded or not that's the problem. Okay? If we end up coming up with a plan that costs us a lot more money so we can get rid of a liability that costs us a lot less, that's not a win. Again, it's also got to be affordable. Okay, so. Yeah, it's another ball we're juggling. So we attempted to boil this down into three simple questions. How much will we contribute to the employees for their retirement? What is the savings vehicle that we will use? And how are we going to pay for it? We just want to answer these three questions, but I don't think we're going to tonight. But I think we're already getting some feedback from each of you um, already to help guide us in the future. We do have some, uh, we do, we're not coming in here completely, you know, blank slate. We do have some recommendations, and we'll talk about steering you to those recommendations. Um, and why we think that would be a good thing for us. But um, for now, I'm going to turn it over to Justin and Jeff, and um, because these are the people that do this every single day and uh, can, I think, explain it to you in, better than I can. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chris. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Or do you we just need want to make sure you don't get feedback between the two? Yeah. Yeah. That's TV. just for the people TV, on TV system. Okay. Know how much I think money you just push that button. This button here? Is it on There's now? at least a million people watching it. Uh, oh boy! Just All right. tap it. Let's see. There, there we go. go. Okay, good. So, as Chris indicated, uh, what we're going to talk about is not uh, the the concepts are not siloed. Uh, we would love to be able to say every one of the decisions you're going to make are mutually exclusive and they are not intertwined in any way, shape, or form. That, as you well know, is not the case. Particularly when when we layer in the complexity of the Affordable Care Act, uh, which is, is, is a goal out there, out in the distance. So what we're going to talk about today, and this evening, are, are these, the, this, some more alph alph alphabet soup for you uh, about the pros and cons of a variety of different funding vehicles that are available to the district. So we're not here to tell you tonight that there's one that's going to be an answer. What we want to do is educate you such that you have a good feel for the pros and cons of each of them so that the dialogue, a healthy dialogue can begin. Fair enough? So with that, um, we're going to go through each of these. And what you're going to find is there is no perfect fit because they all have their own pros and cons. But uh, please ask questions because uh, this, is, this is getting into the weeds of these. So let me first explain an HRA, a health reimbursement account, governed by the IRS, Section 105, 
And we say here that the HRA would be a good fit with the exception of it's subject, unlike many of the other vehicles that we're going to talk about, or some of the others, it's subject to non-discrimination regulations. So what does that mean? That means that bullet point number two underneath there, the contributions amount must be uniform and cannot be based on age or years of service. Well, as a retention tool, that flies in the face of an HRA. Now, one of the reasons why we would, cons you're looking at me and say, well, why are we even talking about that? The benefits of an HRA are very significant. The district controls the dollars. It can be an accrued liability. It can be funded. You can determine the vesting. You could determine the rollover. So there's a lot of control around the financial aspects of the HRA, but one of the big drawbacks is this whole notion of the non-discrimination and uh, the bullet point number one, the lack of clarity on the measurement point. So what council says is this, is that the regs today don't have clarity on whether you measure whether you're discriminatory or not at the beginning point of your deposit date or the end point of your withdrawal date. Well, clearly, if it's the end point of your withdrawal date, there are going to be discriminatory issues because someone's going to withdraw much more than someone else. That, that is going to be a, a, a challenge. The, the other thing is the third bullet point there before we move on is that the regulations are likely to change over the next three years. Uh, we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for clarity on these regulations. And so when we talk about HRA, we say it has some of the uh, niceties of control that we like, but it flies in the face of a long-term retention tool which we can discriminate and provide stronger benefits to those who have been with the district longer. Make sense? So that's, that's the health reimbursement account. The contribution amounts cannot be on years of service or age, but can it be a percentage of salary? Uh, it, it probably it could. Be discriminatory. Um, because that is one way. A, a percentage of salary still could potentially be construed as discriminatory because the highly compensated are, are simply going to get more. And again, it depends on that point number one, the clarity around, and this is the attorneys really get concerned about this, there's enough risk to the district or any, any organization out there that we, we really don't have ruling on whether it should be a, if we could say percentage of salary across the board at the beginning date, then we'd be fine. But there, there isn't the clarity yet. Okay. And, and, and the other thing is we want to make sure that as we move through this process, you have eyes wide open to any regulation changes that might occur so that we're not knee deep into this in a year and a half and you've selected this after a year of diligence, and now you have new regs facing you uh, a year after you've selected a plan. That, but, that. but where those discriminations exist, so highly compensated versus those that are less compensated at the, at the low end, um, aren't there, there are tools in place that um, kind of balance that out, right? You can... So can, can the employee um, contribute to this? Good question. Because so that let would me definitely balance out the... Tools to balance out, I'm not exactly sure if I understand. Well, well that the highly compensated people, um, since they, they, they are compensated from a salary perspective greater, um, I thought that some plans could say, hey, if you're under a certain threshold, then you get extra towards the HRA. There is Does that exist or not to help balance out? Th the, there is flexibility, and experience. you could, for instance, you could provide a greater benefit to the non-highly compensated if you if you wanted to to try to get around that discrimination. But by the time you do that, you've almost defeated the purpose right. of what you're trying to accomplish. Right. Now, on the HRA, employer district money only by IRS code. No employee dollars can go in like the next thing we're going to talk about, which is an HSA. Mm -hmm. Okay. We good on HRA? Yes, sir. All right. HSA. So we like the HSA. Your employees would like the HSA, <coughs> particularly because what we're saying here is it's an excellent choice, but it requires a 100% immediate vesting. So whereas your current liability 
is just that. It's an accrued liability. The HRA could be an accrued liability with all sorts of, uh, all sorts of uh, strings attached. The HSA is an immediate expense, 100% vested. So bullet point number one, are, if this is a long-term retention tool, that sort of flies in the face of that immediate objective, right? Um, the, other, the other thing is, as we, as uh, our, our team members here talked about, talking about this at great length, when you get into the weeds, you say, well, if we're going to provide an HSA contribution, the person's got to have a high deductible health plan as defined by the IRS. And we can't assure that if they're not covered by our plan here at the district. So it would really only be limited to our high deductible health plan participants. So we just eliminated a big swath. Um, loss of control of the funds. Once you deposit those funds, not only is it an expense, it's 100% vested, it's the employee's money. It's in their account. You have no rights to them go forward. And then lastly, um, IRS deems that these dollars are not available for pre-65 health insurance purchase. So those individuals who are retiring, who are looking for this type of coverage, are generally going to be pre-65. They can't use HSA dollars. So again, it's got some of, some of the components of what we're looking for, but a couple of challenges. So HSA, on the other hand, benefit, employees can contribute mm -hmm. to HSA, and they can contribute substantial sums, over $3,300 per year single, over $6,600 a year family. So we've just compared and contrasted two of the more popular vehicles out there that are typically tied to health insurance plans, the health reimbursement account and the HSA, or the health savings account. Any questions on that? All right. So in essence, there's fewer restrictions on, on how we... It's, it's less restrictive than the HRA in many ways in terms of... Well, I guess that's hard no, to say. No, because the, you would... You would and, and, you know, we, for, for the purposes of this high-level discussion, and we'll show you a chart in the middle that, you know, is great evening reading for all of you. Um, but um, you would really need to create uh, uniform contributions for single, for family, participants. It, it, so from a flexibility standpoint, if the district actually were funding it long term, you wouldn't be able to do it really based on compensation or anything else like that either. Is, is there um, income restrictions on the HSA? No income restrictions, no. but there are age restrictions. Anyone right. who's 65 or over who's actually even covered in a high deductible health plan, they can't open it. So if you actually had em people who are active employees, they couldn't. But no, but no salary restrictions. No salary restrictions at all. But, but IRS governed maximum annual limits of deposit. What about tax implications? It's pre-tax. It is pre-tax? Pre-tax deduction. What are the tax implications when you start drawing on it? It, it will be taxed at, will at withdrawal. At withdrawal at yeah. their, their rate. Yeah, we're going to go through some of the tax because, again, so, now, you know, we're, we're trying to talk about a, a multi-pronged objective with uh, a, a variety of different vehicles that all are somewhat putting a square peg in a round hole. You know, if we had a singular objective of saying to employees, we want to fund your future health care liability while you're working, we'd say the HRA and HSA without regard to OPEB liability, you stick with those two. But, but we don't. We have a long-term view of this as well. We have OPEB liability to think about, and we have retention to consider. And so that's why we have these multiple objectives that we're really trying to grapple with and achieve. That, no, that there's no real clear cut. Well, we um, may have to prioritize those objectives. Prioritize the objectives will need to have happen. Survivability. Uh, married, um, you pass away, transferable benefit? Yeah, great. So HRA, no. HSA, yes. The other two vehicles we'll talk about, yes. Because you do own, I mean, it's your... Correct. You own it. Correct. 
And what happens to the survivors in the event both you and your spouse pass away? What happens to the account? Um, I, the funds I, 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 I would think that a surviving, I don't know the answer to this for sure, but I would imagine that a surviving spouse who owns title to that would then direct that to survivorship as well, just like any other asset, whether it's HSA or some of the other vehicles that we're going to talk about. Is it? Very similar to an IRA. Yeah, yeah, it's similar. To, yeah, think of it as medical IRA. How do you divide that one up? We're more concerned about the estate tax then. And you if I can just point out, it's <laughs> limited to the high deductible health plan participants, so you have to be in our insurance plan to mm -hmm. even have the account. So that discourages people from going on their spouse's account. Yeah. So we, thanks. Thank you for pointing that out, Lori. So we want to create an incentive for people to select the best opportunity for them. We, we, you know, as a district, you want to provide benefits, but if they have better benefits at their spouse, you know, uh, we're, we'd like to encourage employees to fully consider their options. Um, this would draw them into your plan <coughs> because the only way that they would be able to get the HSA contribution is if they were a participant in your health insurance high deductible health plan. That's counterintuitive to one of the objectives of law. Okay. If we go to something like a multi-level plan, though, how, how I mean, do we have to change the benefit level? If we go to a high deductible plan, let's say you want to stay, you want to you want to stay in the district's plan to get this benefit, but you may want to pay less of a premium, so you go into a high deductible account, mm -hmm. and your spouse has something that's better, so that's why you're on the high deductible account. You carry a little bit of insurance to offset any major losses. You. You yeah, still, I see where I you're mean, going. You still want to, you, we wouldn't be paying that benefit out in, at the same rate then, I guess, I would assume. Well, um, because, well, first of all, that, that person could select the high deductible health plan for themselves and allow the spouse to do their right. thing. So that, that, yeah. that would be totally acceptable, but that would also be drawing that person continually into your plan, incurring claims costs to, just to receive the HSA contribution for future or current, you know, retirement plan needs. So that that's part of the counterintuitiveness of that. Now, um, again, whether you're single or family is going to determine the contribution. There's no long-term kind of scale that we can grade based on your service, age, uh, job classification, any of that with it. Just say it's locked and loaded according to the IRS based on your coverage category. So that's another drawback. But, you know, what I... What I see, and you don't have to give incentives to people to be in the, in, into a district plan, generally speaking, because right. a district plan is usually a better plan than the private sector plan, and also the private sector entities are being more forceful at avoiding dual insurance. In other words, they're pushing mm -hmm. their employees to take their spouse's plan with somebody else and to get you, you know, because. They want to get everybody off their insurance rather than mm -hmm. keeping them on the insurance. So how much incentive do we have to get give to get people to participate in our plans? I, I think you, you raise a good point that you have a natural built-in incentive because you're currently a plan of choice. What this does is it maintains you as a plan of choice regardless of what your plan design. We could go to a $5,000 high deductible health plan that people would think would be atrocious. And for the record, we've had no conversations about that, and I'm not suggesting that. But as an example, if that's the only way that they would get a retirement plan contribution, now they'd start thinking about, well, I'm, gonna, I'm still going to be on the health plan. Okay. I got to throw go this out there because I'm a little um, wanting to be competitive with other districts. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a gentleman who lives across the street from me who is a business manager for a small school district, and they've just decided flat out they're not going to have retiree benefits and in health insurance. That's a question this board's going to have to grapple they, with. That would be one of our assumptions that we have to determine. Or whether or not we're going to offer it at all. Yeah. I mean, assumption. are we better off just offering to buy you know, an Obamacare plan for retirees? Put them on the exchange? Yeah. I, I think that's kind of a broader discussion. 
I think we're heading that way, relatively speaking. I mean, putting the cap on was one step in that direction. Um, if we're paying a premium for our retirees, then I think it's worth looking at the incentive, coming up with an incentive to move our retirees off our plan. I don't think we can just say, but we need to come up with a way of encouraging them to, to use those dollars more cost effective rather than paying for a very expensive health care plan, which is what they end up having to do today versus what they could probably get on the uh, federal marketplace. So that's, but those things change. They're going to continue to change every year as they go through the Affordable Care Act and, you know, with the new Congress coming in, we don't know who the president's going to be two years from now. It can complain, you know, we can make changes today and it could be all, all together different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. And, and I would just say this, that what, what we're sharing with you today is based on the premise that there is some form of retiree benefit moving forward. And that's a direct, so those are the, that's the premise under which we've been given directive. If that directive changed, then this body's going to have to give that to this team, I think. Um, um, the one thing that you talked about, though, and I, I want to just, Chris mentioned it a few times, this implicit subsidy. I, I, would, I just want to drill down on that because that is a key component of the, the, the Millman study, and that is this is that is your pre-65 retirees on your health plan are much more costly than your active employees, and your active employees are bearing the cost of that. There's no two ways about it. What's that worth? In real terms, that's worth a 50% increase to the retirees and about an 8% decrease to the entire active population. That's what we're talking about. It's significant. So when you see those reductions in OPEB liability, that implicit subsidy is a substantial part of that. And, and having the conversation about allocating cost based on where the cost center is, is, is another conversation that, that's somewhat mutually exclusive to the, certainly mutually exclusive to the funding vehicle going forward, but not to the savings overall, if that makes sense. But looking at that subsidy, it, it, it lends us to the point where, you know, under the Affordable Care Act, we're, per, we're required to provide health insurance to our employees. And, of course, we, we do it anyway, but that's the requirement. Retirees aren't our, aren't our employees. Retirees are a benefit that um, comes from their employment over years that we've, that we've maintained. Correct. It doesn't say that we couldn't have a separate plan for retirees to enroll in that our employees don't subsidize, still giving them a, a health care plan that they can buy into or continue to give them their benefit, let them buy their own plan. You know, they have a choice of buying the, off the district plan. Effectively, we'd be an exchange. We'd be one more option to the exchange for our retirees. And then we could decouple that, that penalty from our employees and help them avoid this tax that's coming up. Isn't that the more reasonable way of going about this? That is an additional strategy. That, and that is a strategy that you might want to consider regardless of what you decide to do on the whole uh, funding the, the OPEB and, and funding the retirement plan because that, that is what, as Chris said, that's what a lot of districts are considering. And that currently is not an option under our plan. Well, it's, it's not an option because we choose. I mean, we can change our plan. Right. I'm, well, yeah. it, it just it needs to be part of the conversation. Right. What I we want to accomplish. We do know we want to accomplish avoiding the Cadillac tax. Mm -hmm. And 8% is a big number, right? If we can drop the 8%. It's a significant number. Yeah. It buys us one more year of trend. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, we're over by what percentage now would we be over if, it, if that Cadillac tax was in today? Or probably over by a good 10, 15, 20 percent. Um, I don't have Today, a, I don't believe we're over. We're, we're not over today. We're but not over The today. question is, will we be over in 2018? I don't have those numbers. I think, right it's, I think it's close. We're very, call, very correctly. close. So the 8 percent would give us the cushion. 8 percent would likely give us cushion. Cushion we need. Yeah. Okay. To avoid the 40 percent excise tax. So, so I'm sorry for taking you back to that implicit subsidy, but, you know, in the, in this context, there's, 
a lot of different things to to talk about. So just just a quick question about participation in our health plans. I have read some things, and you know the Affordable Care Act is a mess. <clears throat> that there are things in the Affordable Care Act that's going to require or promote 100% participation from our employees and dump the spouses. For instance, I have read some opinions of the law where a spouse of an employee, her, her or his insurance provided by us will be taxable income at one point in the Affordable Care Act as a funding mechanism for the act, okay. which will go and push eventually, depending on what we offer, that spouse to their other, if they're employed somewhere else to their. What you might be referring to in the Affordable Care Act is the affordability. Affordability is one of the three tests. Are you gonna provide coverage? Is it affordable and does it meet minimum actuarial value? The affordability clause of the ACA states that if an employee pays more than 9.5% of their earnings for single coverage, it's deemed unaffordable and the district is in play for penalties from the federal government, okay? There is no measurement with regard to the spousal cost. Okay. It's all about the employee single cost today. Right. Um, what that... Um, many commentators would suggest is the glide path over the next five years will be employers allocating resources from family subsidies to single subsidy to maintain affordability. And if, if right. we pay 80% today mm -hmm. of single and family coverage, in the future, the, the, the speculation is you may continue to pay 80% of a growing number and the subsidy to the families will, will decline because you'll need that pot of dollars to yeah. subsidize. And so from, from a tax standpoint, there's nothing in the law that says that will be taxable, but what, what we speculate is the subsidy of family coverage will, will be reduced okay. as a result of trying to fund the continuing escalation of overall and stay penalty immunized. I'll just add that there has been a lot of speculation that that will become a taxable benefit. It will benefit. become a taxable benefit. Right. Yeah. But that's speculation. But that's speculation. Well, yeah. there's nothing yeah, no And you know there. what? If we, if, we were, if we worked off speculation, um, we'd be talking about President Mitt Romney today instead of President Barack Obama. <laughs> but he speculated incorrectly. Oh, <laughs> it's, well, speculation and interpretation of law are two different things. There are pieces of that law could, that could be interpreted. There, there are, there's nothing in the law that says that spousal coverage will be taxable. What, right. what it does say is that all employers must report the value mm -hmm. of your benefits on a W-2. On W-2. Which we currently Taxes. are doing. Okay. And yeah, no, I, with yeah. the purpose of the Cadillac tax in 2018, reporting excise tax, which will be levied on the district, but don't think for a moment that they have, don't have other ulterior motive right. to say at some point in time, are we just going to uh, provide a cap on what's a tax-free benefit? You yeah. know, so that, that's all speculation yeah, as well. Yeah. We'd be here all night on speculation. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've got HRA and HSA. Um, let's talk about some other non-health benefit-related vehicles. TSA, a 403B. So the HRA and HSA were tax-free benefits. The 403B is not a tax-free benefit. It's a tax-deferred benefit, okay? The other thing is it comes up with a couple hang-ups here. <clears throat> the dollars are not available until 59 and a half, really. I mean, you can get at the dollars, but you could pay an excise tax, right? right? It's not, not any different than any IRS-governed retirement plan vehicle. And really... Uh, without a penalty, you can't access those dollars. It's not like an HSA where I've got money in, I can go out to the exchange, buy, buy some health insurance, or, or, you know, even I've got this pot of money and I want to use it for current health care expense. You, you can't do that with a 403B, but it's not encumbered by non-discrimination. 
It's totally um, discretionary in terms of amounts for years of service. Mm -hmm. It's from, from a control standpoint, um, you set the guidelines and rules like the HRA. So we're moving from sort of a, a health-related accounts to, to retirement-related accounts that, again, some are going to have pros and cons. Um, then the 457, got a couple of things here. Um, advantages, the dollars are, separation at, are available at separation. Uh, they are available pre-59 and a half but they're taxed. Uh, vesting is limited to $18,000 per year. That may or may not be an issue uh, at any given point in time. You may or may not, as a district, contribute more than 18. Um, there are uh, limited vendors, and you need to set up new plans. And, and so um, this plan has got some nice features, but again, tax deferred, limited vesting opportunities, maybe certainly not as flexible as a 403B. It's not tied to the health insurance. We can be discriminatory in, in terms of uh, length of service, age, service requirements, et cetera. And then this is what I referred to in terms of your um, leisure reading. So what we've done is we've taken the HRA, the HSA, the 403B, and the 457 and said, you know, what accomplishes a variety of these objectives and and I would just you know I would just draw your attention to a couple of key I, I think a couple of key things you know employer controlled vesting when do employees get at the dollars right I, I think from a long-term perspective that's probably an objective even if you're funding it today you you want to be able to set some of the rules um, you see that the HRI can do it, but we've talked a lot about the hang-ups there, particularly from the non-discrimination. HSA can't do it, 403B can do it, and we have some limited, um, <coughs> limited availability under 457. Um, a couple of these others, you know, dollars available for pre-65 employer-sponsored, uh, for, for uh, yeah, pre-65 employer-sponsored coverage. Only the HRA would allow that, so that's, that's a pretty good equalizer between these others because um, uh, quite candidly, the HRA is sort of at the bottom of our list from a, from a suitability standpoint for this particular vehicle. Um, we have complications. You know, I said nothing's mutually exclusive. What happens if you have a retiree and then they come back in as an active? You know, we, we have to think through those applications. Um, the dollar amounts, the contributions. There really are no limitations. Uh, pretty sizable amounts here with the 40, 457 and 403B. Uh, much more limited. I, I got these. a question. 53,000, I mean, that's not the normal limit. What's that? That's a different limit than your normal limit on a 403B. The 53,000? I mean, isn't a 40, it's the same thing as a 401K for the rest of us, right? A 403B is the normal retirement account that you can contribute to. For, for, for not for profit, right? Yeah, for right. government. Right? Isn't that, that some? That 53,000, is that uh, catch up provisions and all that added mm -hmm. together? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you're correct. It's not the normal limit, it's the maximum if an employee is doing catch up provisions. There's, there's, if you're a certain age, you can increase your, your funding. Right. Um, if you haven't contributed to the maximum for X number of years, you can do a catch up, it's called. Yeah, and there's, oh, and, and yeah, there's that special and there, provision. And there's, there's significant. When you get to those higher ages, they're pretty significant. Yeah, there's that special. And yeah, okay. It helps to be gray. Yeah, it does. Now, the other thing is, um, you know, they're all going to help us with the OPEB liability. The non discrimination, we talked about that sort of knocks the HRA out. There are, uh, there are some non-discrimination rules around the HSA, which I, I alluded to uh, by virtue of the fact whether you're single or family, everyone has to have uniform contribution. Um, the risk of the non-discrimination law changing. Tax-free benefit, so we've got two tax-free benefits, two tax-deferred benefits. 
What do you mean by tax free? That has different meanings for different people. I I'm sorry, I didn't hear. What do you mean by tax free? Define tax free. Well, the HRA, the HRA benefit, for example, yes. if the district put in $500 yep. of a benefit mm -hmm. into your account yep. and you drew that out for qualified medical expenses under 105H, which is the same as your cafeteria plan, you receive those benefits and you pay not a nickel in tax on it. Okay. Same Absolutely thing with the HSA. tax free. Yep, same thing with the HSA. Truly tax free. But as you can see, that also comes with some other strings attached. So this is really intended to start the conversation around these because as, as we've heard, prioritizing the objective and actually uh, creating a list of the lesser of the evils that help us accomplish the objective is, is a, a conversation where we really need to head. And again, like Chris said, this is maybe more than a 30,000 foot view, but a little, little deeper than that. But in order to move to the next conversation, um, this overview should give you a, a good idea of the options available. And these are the options. It's not like there are three or four other options out there or we, we discarded four other options. These are really the options that are being used by other districts for well, these vehicles. It seems to me the 403B gives you the most flexibility you can you could decide to give the benefit at X years of service, incremental over X years of service. Let's say you wanted to, to give an employee, let's say 20,000 or 403B after year 10, mm -hmm. another 25 and after year 15, 20, 25 up to 80,000. It has the ability to grow mm -hmm. because it's invested. Tax deferred. Tax deferred. Mm -hmm. And we would wipe out, we would wipe out the, the OPEB obligation at the same time. We'd, we'd, we'd result in employee retention value because you don't get it for it, right? except for after 10 years of service, 15, 20, 25, mm -hmm. or per special contract agreement, depending upon how we handle our contracts going forward. And it allows the most flexibility, providing we don't hit limits for those employees on their contribution for the 403B. It sounds somewhat simpler, except for we don't end up with a high deductible health care plan re linked to this. It's just eliminating our Correct. OPEB. Correct. That would become a separate topic how we deal with mm -hmm. implementing a high deductible right. health care. Right. Okay. Any, any Ms. other questions? Ms. Estrom, is that correct? My, have you thought of it that way as well or not? I mean, you're nodding your head like you've yeah. thought of this before. I did, um, and our uh, other school districts are uh, going the 403B route as well. I think that the fact that the money isn't available until age 59 and a half is more attractive than age 65 for um, some of the other things. Uh, 457 is available at separation. Um, I think it's also a viable choice, but the 403B is something that most people understand, and uh, you could make those contributions, like you said, at certain intervals. Right, and, and that would that would get the, and it also benefit from that because it would be higher than the seventy-five thousand that we currently have, and they would get some growth over those years, mm -hmm. and I would say that we're seeing more and more educational professionals stay until 60 right, anyway. Yeah, it would push the um, age of retirement a bit unless someone wanted to retire and just wait to access their 403B funds. And But you can use the money for anything then. Right. You wouldn't even have to use it to purchase insurance. insurance. Right. right. And that gives the employee ultimate flexibility in retirement. The downside is there's there's going to be a there's going to be a medium, more earlier cost to the district to f to contribute to that 403b than waiting until retirement for our employees, but it becomes a retention benefit that we currently don't have. It does because we have we have experienced teachers leaving now, and we have uh, that's the only option where we have um, the complete control over the vesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
That's right. We can use it as a vesting constraint in yeah, terms of them right. leaving. Once we give it to them, it's only vested after year. Right. After five years in the fund, it might only be vested five years later, five years later, five years later. We can well, determine that. you tie that. a percentage there's, of vesting well, to Well, there's still a maximum, years, though. You, uh, what you're saying, right? Well, the, yeah. Yeah, but there's well, a vesting option there. We can tie it. can't make it 30 years. That. That we, I mean, you, you wouldn't want to make it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. there's some plateaus. Right. The other thing with the 403B is you, you can you can pay it out after retirement, where something like a 457 has to be paid out upon retirement. And so there's flexibility in how we actually pay out that benefit. And we could pay it out after, but then if, if we pay it out after, then it doesn't really help the retention issue. Right. You could you could vest it over five years if you have a $53,000 maximum on an annual basis, but you, you are intending to pay out more than that, you can do it over two or three years after retirement is what I'm suggesting. Yeah, but that, the problem with doing it after retirement, it just doesn't help that retention plan. It's but also not earning anything for it, them. And it and doesn't that's earn right. anything. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, that's, right? that's. So uh, we started this conversation by saying this is, a, you know, intertwined with a, a high deductible health plan. I just want to give you an, an idea of, uh, of also what we're working on and creating this benefit offering uh, for July rollout that would be an offering to the employees to select between the conventional plan that we have today and a high deductible health plan that would include a uh, approximately $1,300 district contribution to the health plan. This is totally separate to the conversation that we're having about the the retirement plan. but the reason we're talking about it is because we can realize some savings by moving to a high deductible health plan which will help fund the retirement benefit so one of the big questions how are you going to pay for this and we've done a tremendous amount of modeling had a lot of conversations about what benefit level we're comfortable with and we you know in our in our upcoming conversations we'll be ready to share sort of a sneak preview on what's the possibility and how are we going to pay for this over time. And, and the high deductible health plan will assist the district fund exactly what we talked about for the last, you know, for the last half hour, 45 minutes. Is it, is it possible for us to, you know, the idea is that I guess we aren't going to hit the Cadillac tax if we decouple the two plans, the retirement plan and the employee plan. But um, it, it would be possible for us to take those savings and use it as a subsidy to the premium too, right? Could. I mean, you didn't necessarily have to use it to put it into for to a, if if we would just say, okay, we're we're going to be able to subsidize the premiums through these savings, and then lower the premium for the employees. Yes, and and there's you know through the plan and then also through the implicit subsidy i'll get back to that mm -hmm. as as a potential yes so you have options but as as chris said the questions that are looming out there are you know how much are we going to contribute what vehicle are we going to use how are we going to pay for it and so hopefully the time that we spent tonight has at least helped you frame the conversation and maybe eliminate a few of the options that were swirling around so that we can distill this conversation on a go-forward basis and begin to focus a little more clearly on the vehicles, the amounts, and things like that in upcoming conversations. I think that's... I guess one of the questions I've had is when you look at the affordability clause, we have some of our employees that are on a very high-class health care plan that won't make the, avail the affordability criteria, right. I don't think, right? This plan will be affordable. Your high deductible health plan will be affordable. So, so the high deductible health plan serves a number of purposes. Number one, it achieves the objective of providing a high deductible health plan. Number two, it achieves the objective of affordability under the uh, Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And number three, it provides savings to fund a potential health care retirement vehicle. So this is a, a, a key component uh, that addresses all three objectives. It, it provides savings that can be plowed back to the employees in some way. Correct. Whether it's mm -hmm. option A, B, or C. Correct. Okay.
So, uh, next steps. And really, the, in the December meeting, um, we expect to have recommendations so that uh, not only will your conversation be framed by here are all alternatives, but we'll put some numbers to it, put some specifics to it so that you can actually conceptualize what it looks like on paper and on a go-forward basis so that it's not just for now, it's, it's the beginning of a multi-year strategy. The high, the high deductible plan, mm -hmm. that, that's for a family too, right? Just yes. Like single. $2,600 in network deductible for a single, and it would be double that for a family. It would be double that for Correct. a family. Correct. And don't forget, you have this wonderful clinic that's now fully operating right, right. that, um, in combination with the high deductible health plan, makes a, uh, makes a very, very attractive offer for an employee to get high quality, low cost health care. Could you say that again about the wonderful clinic we have? <laughs> and emphasize the word wonderful? <laughs> so would the $1,300 in district savings double on the family plan, or what, what, what does that look like? It'd be 50% so, contribution. Okay. And Any, the maximum out-of-pocket would also go up to 50%? Yes, okay. correct. What's the deductible for the current family plan? 1350. 13 okay. 1375. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we'd be looking at, and uh, Benico did provide us with a um, out-of-pocket stratification, so we know the percentage of um, people that have um, hit their out-of-pocket max and the percentage that never spend more than $500 and all of that so mm -hmm. we can, we'll be able to provide you with that sort of information next month as well when we put our numbers to the paper. So the IRS determines the high deductible policies? Yeah, IRS determines range? what the minimum threshold is for okay. high deductible. What is the minimum threshold? Thirteen hundred dollars. Thirteen hundred is the minimum threshold. Minimum for threshold a, for a high deductible. Yes. And that's for a single. That's for, for a single. single, right? But if we were to just the reason why we're landing here at the twenty six hundred for for a, for a discussion point, if we go to a thirteen hundred dollar deductible, the actuarial difference between your six seventy five and your thirteen hundred is peanuts. Right. It's not meaningful. Right. It's not going to get anybody to move. We're not going to deliver any savings. Yep. So we've got to take sort of a bold step, but really when you think about a 2600 with a $1,300 uh, district contribution, you're, you're really telling employees the first $1,300 of your health care is on the house. And if you don't use it, it rolls over. That's a pretty good deal. So we think we can create a win-win around that. And a lower premium for the employee. Correct. So the 1300 will roll over year over year. Is there a cap? Are we talking about a cap? We can determine that depending on what vehicle we put the 1300 in. Right. Hmm. It'd be very, yeah, well, that would be very attractive for someone who's not sick a lot, wouldn't it? A younger person. So in addition to next steps, I see what we're doing in December. When do we have to make decisions by to put these things into effect? We, you want to go ahead?
So can we change this at any time, or are there certain times where it makes sense to change it? You, you offered one reason to make a decision sooner than later, but I mean, is there any restriction as to when can we take eight months on this decision? Okay, so now you told me we have two, okay, so either in December or June. Which one has less complications? <laughs> we were looking at a July 1 date to offer the high deductible health plan. And in order to do that, we need to communicate with employees starting in April and May. Yeah, I don't. May, I, June. I personally, I don't think I'd be ready to make a decision in December on this. <coughs> That's why I'm asking. Right. It, it's not that we would have a plan in place for January one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. It's that we would be working towards a plan to put in place July one, so that those people on January calendar years kind of know what's coming down the road. Most likely what we would end up doing is transitioning and allowing those people with those deductibles to actually do an 18-month deductible. We wouldn't make them start all over. I guess, I guess I have the question of why don't we just change to a high deductible plan and, and implement the benefit to the employee across the board rather than giving it as an option to choose a low deductible plan versus a High deductible plan. Yeah, we, we could do that. Um, we, t we discussed just making a switch July 1st. Everybody's on a high deductible plan. Um, we also discussed a softer approach where there'd be like, you know, maybe like this is, this is the last year. Next year, everybody goes to a high deductible plan or two years. So we, we've talked about that. Uh, well, I think, you know, from an administrative point of view, it's so much easier to administrate for the employees as a whole if it's across the board than trying to than trying to work with multiple plans and enrollments and we we had also been operating from a perspective of giving the employees choice that was and, a directive this board gave you yeah so. mm -hmm. and creating a plan where you know it didn't matter to us actuarially which plan they ended up choosing um, so we were one of the goals was a cost neutral impact on the yeah. district. So that we would avoid that whole adverse selection. The idea of sicker people would choose the richer plan, just really making the plans similar, just structured differently. And that whole idea of rolling over the um, savings account, whether I think we're looking at HRA for that, is. Um, going to be a very attractive option for, for employees and also help drive the making good consumer driven decisions. Yeah, but I, I guess I don't, I, don't know, I guess the board has their own perspective on that, but it seems to me that if we're making the switch to ensure that there's definition to the benefits for the district and for the employee, it's much harder to know what those benefits are when you have the ability to select. You know, you're, you're rolling the dice as to whether people will select option A or option B mm -hmm. with the selection. Mr. Coleman. I mean, our, our, the discussions that you're referring back to are two, two year old discussions. Now we have a lot more information. Mm -hmm. And we just need to update ourselves on those conversations and remind ourselves of what those priorities are. And, and we, we may have to, going to that one, that first or second slide on priorities, we may have to figure out where do we lie. Our priorities could have been different two years ago versus now, but we didn't have the details two years ago. We're trying to go through those now, and our priorities will drive the direction that we, we go in. But we will, we can't attain all of those in the same balance, or just are in an equal balance. Something's got to give. Um, Oh, yeah, and you're right, because two years ago, we didn't think of the the uh, retiree subsidy, whatever you want to call that. What, what's Impl the implicit, implicit subsidy. The implicit subsidy. We learned a new term. We knew it was now. there, but we really didn't have it defined. Right. I mean, 
and measure, yeah. we didn't know what the benefit would be in terms of um, that we could plow back to the employees in return for them mm -hmm. being shifted to a high deductible plan mm -hmm. so it, it's not immediate out-of-pocket cost for them you know oh if I have something happen, it's gonna cost me $2,600 yeah, yeah but if it, nothing happens you gain 1300 you know that's and the odds are nothing will happen for a large number of a group of our employees and twenty six hundred dollars probably won't break the bank should something happen in the future for a large number of employees um, although there will be employees that currently will rely on that low they don't have that extra twenty six hundred dollars mm -hmm. that they're currently so okay any other questions Anything from the administration? We will be back next month. <laughs> it's guaranteed. <laughs> You'll be back. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, I guess the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.